What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live Stream. And today we have the one and only Chris from ACI Aquaculture on. How you doing, buddy? Good hit, Devin. How are you doing, buddy? Wonderful, thank you. So, Chris. Uh, thanks. Go ahead. Oh, it's always awesome having you on. We always have really great conversations. Um, today I'd figure we kind of talk about kind of keeping healthy corals, kind of what it takes, and you know, coloring up corals and kind of getting the best things. Now you aquaculture corals, I mean, that's obviously what you do every day is try and get corals to be their best. So it's kind of the perfect man for the job today. It's it's never ending, you know. Um, I'm always striving to try to get the the best results from what we do to our systems, and it's just you know it's been an evolving process, especially since um, about November of last year, not last year, but uh, 2019 when we started with that suppressed pH issue that everybody seems to have. And it seems to now really be uh, taking off. I'm getting blown up constantly <laughs> about how to dose Kalkwasser the way we mm -hmm. do it. And listen, there's a ton of ways to do things. And I've perfected a method that I think everybody should use for Kalkwasser because it makes it efficient and um, it works extremely well. I mean, the results speak for themselves and been happy with that. And now we've got all these other things that we're playing with now to just improve the health and growth and color of the corals. Perfect. Okay. So just, just to start for those that don't fully know, what's the ACI method of dosing Kalkwasser? The ACI method of dosing Kalkwasser. Okay. Yeah. The only reason we even came up with this, it was kind of stumbled upon us. Mm -hmm. um, it was all because uh, I, I, I got talked into getting Neptune, um, the Apex systems, a few years ago, and um, I used them basically so I could have something testing my water regularly. But then I also started looking into them more and learning more about them and what I can actually do with them. And, you know, I like to say that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like Jake on this. I like to be the control. Yeah. And me letting go of control was really hard for me to do. And now I like to say I control the control. Yeah. <laughs> and without the fusion app and my addiction to what I do, um, I wouldn't be able to dose the Kalkwasser in the method that we use it. Um, and, and we of course have to use other means of, um, hydroxides to yep. keep our pH up because of the addiction that I do have for corals. And the fact that most people don't have the biomass that we have in one of our coral systems to the water volume. And that was the only thing we could come up with as the reason why our pH could not meet the goals we wanted to with straight Kalkwasser. Mm -hmm. So we, um, we dose Kalkwasser. It's very simple. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, is, is any of the ways right or wrong? No, they all will work. But if you want to achieve something specific, like a consistent, steady, constant pH, there's no other way to do it. I've tried mm -hmm. every other way possible and I can't get it to stay the way we have it. We have about a, Point four, no point oh four, fluctuation in pH, um, yeah. twenty four hours a day. I mean, it's nothing. Basically, here's how we do it. Um, a calc stir will not work with the method that I came up with. Um, mm -hmm. You have to have a, a mixing vessel that you can um, mix up your calc washer in, and if you're using a good calc washer um, and it's a high purity, um, exactly six grams of calc washer will dissolve completely in RO water, purified mm -hmm. water, and you'll have no sediment at the bottom. If And your pH in that solution will equal 12.4 to 12.5. Wait, six grams per what volume of RO? Oh, one gallon. Okay, six grams per gallon. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I thought I mentioned it. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, nope, just um, six grams. That's it. Like, <laughs> okay. Six grams per one gallon of yep. purified or RO water. I use RODI. Yep. Um, and the pH, if again, if the calc washer is of high purity, it will reach a pH value of 12.4 to 12.5. And that is key. Um, if your pH is only reaching 12.3, you won't achieve the goals. And people say to me, well, that's only 0.1 difference. Well, that's 10 times less potent or 20 times less potent if you're actually getting a 12.5 a reading out of it. So mm -hmm. it's it, the minute amount, that 0.1 is a huge difference when it comes to pH and how caustic the uh, pH actually is and what the values you're going to get out of it. So 
what I did was um, I started this when I started using the potassium hydroxide that I talked about uh, along uh, a year ago or so with you. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't want to just solely use the potassium hydroxide because I knew what the outcomes of that were going to be. It was going to achieve my goal with no issues, but I was going to end up constantly having to worry about my potassium levels getting to um, you know levels that yeah. are not good for the system. So I had to figure out a way to do this in my systems, and it actually – I've taught – I don't know. I couldn't even tell you. Countless reefers around the world that messaged me asking me how to dose calc washer <laughs> the way we do it. Yeah. And I tell everybody right off the bat, if you want to learn my method, then everything you thought you knew about calc washer, go out the door. And that means if you bought yourself a calc stir, you can't do my method. I'm sorry. I don't have the time. I'll never be able to figure it out with you because I've already tried it mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. So you take the take a mixing vessel that you're going to keep your calc solution in and – you mix up your solution and you seal that as good as you possibly can because you don't want atmospheric air interacting with the calc solution because it'll end up creating carbonates, mm -hmm. um, which is that little thin film that you get on the surface of the yeah. water of your calc washer. And if you can see through it, you're okay. If you can't see through it or it's getting opaque, then you've got way too much interaction with, um, mm -hmm. with atmospheric air. What it does is it creates carbonates in that solution, which then devalues the pH and you basically as you go along you're getting weaker and weaker and weaker so you're you're chasing that goal even harder and you end up diluting your system with too much RO water and you have a salinity a salinity drop yeah. so with the way we do it we have it set on our apex dose pumps mm -hmm. and we have a rule set into place that it took us a little bit to get to um, we took our average pH of the day and that's what we program the dosing pump to start dosing. So when you have that average go in there, it'll probably start dosing immediately because unless you're doing, you know, um, basically it happens at nighttime because it, during the day, your pH will rise naturally because yep. of photosynthesis taking place. Mm -hmm. So everybody says, why don't you do it 24 hours a day? Because there's no reason to during the day because you already have a natural rise and a natural uptake of CO2. Yeah. Okay. I have a question on this one. Yes. Yes. Now, would dosing it from your day boost your overall average, or is it better just at night just to contract the dip? Like, is it better to raise the bar altogether, or to try and keep it, you know, a little bit lower but in the middle by getting rid of the dip, basically? No. And here's the reason why: you'll yeah. never achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. You will never achieve your goal. And I, I tried it time and time again, dosing it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it just doesn't work. Um, you, you get a, you, your pH isn't as suppressed as it was, but I've learned that, you know, there's a reason why the ocean has a consistent pH and there's a reason why animals thrive when they're living in the ocean. And when we put them in our aquariums, are they thriving or are they just surviving? Mm -hmm. And I'm not satisfied with survival. I'm satisfied with them thriving yeah. and, and growing and doing amazing and seeing things I've never seen before. And I've been able to see things I've never seen before with the pH being, it never goes below 8.29 in any one of my systems nice. and it never goes above. Well, I can't say the one system still goes to 8.4, but that's because <laughs> it hasn't fully balanced yet Yeah, because there's a lot of things that happen when you put calc washer in your system. Hang on one second. Okay. What are you doing? Okay. No, buddy. I'm, I'm live. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it's all right, buddy. Um, my little man wanted to come in and say hello. <laughs> um, so it, it, pH in the ocean, pretty consistent. You know, I think the world average used to be about 8.3. And if I'm correct on this, and I might be wrong, but I think that it's now right around 8.27, 8.25. It has been, you know, reduced a little bit because of, you know, all the extra CO2 going into the atmosphere. And, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a it's a problem, and we all know it. Um, how do you fix it though? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But in our aquariums, we're in a closed house, whatnot. Um, I'm in open air, and it still didn't make sense to me. But um, so your pH is going to be suppressed in any single any aquarium that that I've ever talked to anybody. I've never had a pH stay, or actually even you know never stay at eight point three. Yep. always is below, but maybe peaks in the day at 8.3 with the method of, of dosing or whatever they're dosing at, at that, you know, in their system. So the reason why dosing at 24 seven won't work is because of the dilution factor that you're going to mm -hmm. have. 
if you still want that pH to continue to rise, you're going to have to add more Kalkwasser. Yeah. So our method, going back to that, we have our dosing pump set to start dosing our, P, our, our Kalkwasser at 8.29. So how much Kalkwasser do we dose overnight? Well, that's the thing that I can't answer for anybody. Everybody that has their own aquarium, they have to tell me. I can help them get to a starting point, and then they have to dial it in from there because I don't know your system. I don't know how much water exactly that it evaporates, and my systems on the farm are averaging about 15 gallons per night Mm -hmm. in the wintertime. In the summertime, it's about 10 gallons per night, so dosing has to be adjusted from – for me, because of the open air, it has to be adjusted. So I've got that all figured out now, which has been, you know, super fun. Um, <laughs> I did have some hiccups, but you know, we, we got it all figured out, and um, you know, those hiccups are gone, and um, we're we're doing extremely well. But so basically, you program in your dosing pump. You you want your total evaporation to be dosed yeah. while your dosing pump is going to be active and working according to your pH. So if you have, a, say, a one gallon um, evaporation on a daily basis, the program you put into your dosing pump is two gallons to dose for 24 hours. Okay. And the reason being is because again, during the day, your pH is going to naturally rise. So it's going to go above that rule that you put into place on your dose pump. Mm -hmm. So that way you have, when the pH reaches that 8.29 or 8.3 mark, my dosing pump stops dosing. So for a good 12 hours because of my photo period, there is literally no dosing of any hydroxides whatsoever going on. And then about an hour to two hours after the lights go out, the pH gets down to that 8.29 mark and it stays there Mm -hmm. because I have it dialed in to dose double, but that gets your dosage correct so that you're dosing exactly what you evaporate in that period of time Mm -hmm. when the lights are out. And it makes a huge difference. Interesting. I might, I'm going to try only dosing at night. I dose at 24 seven. And what I've been doing is in the apex, I've been seeing how often the dosing pump comes on and using that to tweak it. So I can see, you know, okay, it comes on hourly, you know, you up at another mill or two. Okay. It only comes on every couple hours. I've been slowly tweaking it to get it. So my ATO barely ever kicks on. You know, I, I talked to a lot of very, um, seasoned reefers about this mm-hmm. and, um, uh, there's this one guy he's been doing it since the seventies and he remembers the Kalkwasser when it was, you know, the only way to go, you know, all the way through the eighties yeah. up into the nineties, everybody was using Kalkwasser and then the balling method came in and it just kind of Kalkwasser went to the curb and everybody always has a suppressed pH since then where pHs weren't as bad when people were using Kalkwasser. This guy couldn't wrap his head around what I was telling him. And I said, just do it exactly like I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. And forget everything you thought about with the balling method. Forget everything you thought about with numbers on your alkalinity. Just forget about them. If you yeah. don't, your your head's going to just talk you out of doing this. Because I would have never done this, Devin, if it wouldn't have been for my friend Chris Wood at Captivate Aquaculture telling me to look at my corals. Don't worry about a number. Mm-hmm. Because that number is means nothing if your corals look amazing. Yeah. And Fair. So my biggest problem in the beginning was my alkalinity went all the way. Uh, I was very avid and always I was always very avid about an 8.3 to 8.6 pH or um, alkalinity in my systems. And when I started doing the Kalkwasser dosing along with the other hydroxides, my alkalinity went all the way to like 11. And I'm freaking out. You know, and this yeah. is on my main farm system. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, a little crazy to do it on the main farm system. But you know what? <laughs> Everything went well because I listened. And – that's the biggest thing I have a problem that, that I don't have a problem with it, but I have a hard time with when I explain in detail how it needs to be done. And then somebody tries to tweak it a different way. Why are you trying to reinvent what I've worked on for a year and know works extremely well? And I know all like if you have a calc stir and mm-hmm. you want to use it with your dosing pump, you're not going to be able to achieve what I do. It's yeah. not, it's impossible. It is impossible unless your calc stirs, you know, 50 gallons. Mm-hmm. Now- <laughs> Are you right. still doing hydroxides alongside this or just this? No. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I have to. Yeah. If I want my pH to stay stable, I have to have my um, – I use a multitude of other hydroxides now, um, not just the potassium. Mm-hmm. It's a concoction pretty much that I've uh, mixed up so that way I don't get an overabundance of one particular element being dosed yeah. into my system. And that was the biggest thing that was a learning curve for me in the beginning. <laughs> 
Me too. Uh-huh. <laughs> you told me about it, and I was yeah. like, Devin. <laughs> but um, it, 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 you know, the, the, we use four different hydroxides. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not telling anybody how to do it. Uh, it's too dangerous for a hobbyist level because mm-hmm. you can achieve what we do with Kalkwasser. Yeah. And if you do it the way I just explained it. Um, so in our system with the 15 gallons of being evaporated, that's 43,000 mLs. Mm-hmm. I programmed, you know, I did that at first and I was like, this isn't working. And then I noticed that it was, you know, never keeping my pH where it was supposed to be. So then I started playing around with, you know, um, okay, how do I get this to happen where it only happens at nighttime because of the, um, you know, natural rise during the day. Mm-hmm. So then I started, I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, my, my light cycle is 12 hours. My no lights, non-light cycle is 12 hours. So, okay, I need to double the dose that I program into the dosing pump so mm-hmm. that I actually get the correct amount of calc washer dosing on each individual dose. Now, are you dosing supplementations throughout the day or just at night? For what? Like what supplementations? What do you mean? I, okay. So two questions, I guess. One, for your alkalinity, is it having bigger swings from dosing, you know, double at night versus nope, stable? And then, My alkalinity. Right. Yeah. And then I guess... um. Yeah, are you dose? So if you're doing just calc at night, are you doing any type of sub dosing in the day for alkalinity or other sub elements? I have a calcium reactor that um, when I first started this process, it didn't run for over six months. Yeah, you know this is the great thing about this method is is my my system was eating up twenty kilograms of Julian Sprung's two little fishes uh, reborn mm-hmm. almost month, just a little bit like five weeks. I would be taking the reactor apart, cleaning it out, putting another 20 kilograms in, two bottles of CO2 monthly, you know, two liters a minute at 6.5 pH going directly into my protein skimmer. And I couldn't keep my alkalinity at 8.3 because of the biomass that was in the system. And the reactor was rated for 5,000 gallons. And it was Mm -hmm. only on 2,200 gallons. (laughs) 20 gallons. (laughs) Devin, I was about to break. I'm like, what am I, what, what, I can't put more, I can't put dosing pumps on the dose alkalinity buffer at the same time because it's what the calcium reactor is for. Yeah. That's when I started talking to Chris in more detail and we brainstormed about it. And he's like, you know, I got an idea. Mm -hmm. He's like, if if you're, if you're, if you're up for listening to me, um, (laughs) I'll send you the stuff and, um, you know, you just need to follow my directions. And that's when I started with the potassium hydroxide and it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, the the alkalinity value of the, the three other hydroxides that we use is like 10 times the amount of alkalinity power that a, uh, calc washer will give you, but, that's okay because I'm only dosing minute amounts, like two to three mils of this stuff every ten minutes or as needed yeah. during that time period of time. Because I don't want my pH to go below eight point two nine, so I have it set to dosing the, the really okay. potent hydroxides yeah. at eight point two eight. So, so <laughs> how how high does yours goes up to? Because eight point two nine is probably most people's high, and that's your low. So what's your yeah. I peak during the day. Okay, in the beginning, my peak was yeah. Sorry about my cat. <laughs> my peak during the day uh, used to be about eight point four to eight point six. Yeah, I know eight point four to eight point five. Mm-hmm. Now, because it takes time for your system to balance, because of the way you're putting carbonates in your water, and carbonates are not all created equal. Whether people want to tell me that they are, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, mm-hmm. a sodium based carbonate is not the same as the potassium based carbonate, not the same as the carbonates that are created by, by hydroxides. It's all different. And sodium based carbonates are something you're going to continuously have to dose. Mm-hmm. You're never going to achieve a st- uh, the stability um, to the point where you're dosing less of it. Yeah. It's always going to be something. It's a money pit for an aquarium. Mm-hmm. It works. I, I'm not knocking it. It works. Mm-hmm. But for me, it's not cost effective. Yeah. And for a lot of reefers, especially when an SPS dominated system, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. You know, if they incorporate the calc washer into it on this method, they'll be blown away, especially if they get that whole alkalinity number out of their head. Because it literally took, I, I, I tell you, what, one system I have right now that was the last system we started dosing hydroxides on, and we dosed the, um, the, the calc washer is the main one. Mm-hmm. 
And um, it's great because I don't have to worry about my salinity fluctuating a whole lot at all in the summertime or the wintertime. It's just, yeah. you know, topping off with, with water. It makes it really nice not having to worry about that part of it. But my alkalinity in that system went all the way to 13.63. My head almost exploded. Yeah, that's up there. What, what is it now? Does it, does it still say that high? Because I know no, you don't worry it, about it as much. So I don't worry about it at all. I don't really want it. The only time I worry about my alkalinity is if it gets down to like 8.3. And yep. then I start looking into, okay, I got I to gotta tweak my calcium reactor, add a little bit more effluent. But the, when I started doing the hydroxide, that two liters a minute that I was running through that, my, my reactor, when it finally started running again, when things started balancing, I literally run 100 and it was 145 mils a minute through my calcium <laughs> reactor. I was it's like, a small river. <laughs> yes. And I, and I have not changed or added new calcium reactor media since i changed it out when i started boosting my boosting my suppressed ph a year ago mm -hmm. so i saved um monthly i don't know Huge. i can't remember what i used to spend on julian sprung's uh <laughs> you know reactor media i think it's like 100 bucks in a store so that's yeah. 1200 bucks right there on no one way. system and we've yep. got six systems that are running the stuff so i mean you can kind of do the math and figure out how much money we've saved over the last year it's you know in the uh, probably almost ten thousand dollars in additives and other stuff it's lots lots and lots and calquas is cheap and yeah. it's efficient it works as mm -hmm. long as you're getting high purity that's yep. the key high purity okay low purity has a lot of aluminum in it mm -hmm. <laughs> which is bad for your aquarium this is so, fair I, I don't know if did I, did I finish everything on that, Devin, because um, you wanted to know the method and how we do it. And I think yep. I have the, one more thing to put into there. So mm -hmm. when you program your, your dosing pump, if you're going to program it to dose one gallon or basically 387.5 mLs, yep. you have to double that if you're going to mm -hmm. put the pH rule in. Okay. And then the first two or three days, you'll probably go a little bit above that. Because it's got to get balanced and get used yeah. to it, and then it'll go and it'll even itself out over you know, the, over okay. a few days. Um, it'll blow your mind because your alkalinity is going to spike so quick, and that's the first thing I tell people: don't call don't me when out. your alkalinity. Yeah, <laughs> don't call me when your alkalinity spikes. Don't message me when your alkalinity spikes. You know, give it a couple of days. Watch your corals. Mm -hmm. Your corals will tell you if they're happy or not. If, yeah. if they're not happy, then shoot me a message, and I'll gladly help you figure out what the problem is. So you don't worry about your alkalinity spiking. Now I'm assuming it's a lot higher now. Like, what what's your average now for elk? Well, that's the thing is it balances. Um, mm -hmm. In time, all my alkalinities in every single one of the systems, like the first farm system that we started on, it went to like 11. Yeah. And then in a six-month period of time, it took six months for that alkalinity to go back down to where my calcium reactor was turned on when my apex did a test on the alkalinity mm -hmm. and it would turn on at 8.6. Yeah. It, it would come on for six hours and shut off and not run for another week. And then it would come on for six hours and shut off and not run for four days. <laughs> Barely does and it was just, it, it, it was just keeping it where I didn't want it to go um, above Mm -hmm. But it, when it, as soon as it dipped below it by like, what is it, 8.59, it would kick on. And yeah. then by the time it was done dosing, um, after that six-hour period and the next test came through on the Trident, mm -hmm. it would be at you know 9.5. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just learned to just forget about it. And when the alkalinity actually got back down to where it was at 8.3, mm -hmm. that's when I started to get concerned about you know dialing in my calcium reactors. And honestly, it's – I just really dialed my reactors in right before Christmas, and now they run nonstop, and the alkalinity goes from like 8.3 up to like 8.5, and it doesn't really go much in between that on a 24-hour-a-day basis for the last, what, yeah. month? So this is a bit of a different way of thinking because most reefers, you know, they, they pick an elk number, and they target it, and that's it, right? And then the, the side battles, like, at pH up or this, you're not as worrying about elk as much, but you're just, like, trying to peg that pH at a certain point. And I worry about my pH. Is. My pH, and, and from what I've learned, and from what I learned from my friend Chris, who is a very well-renowned marine scientist, he was he's a, he's a genius when it comes to this stuff. I mean, he's helped me in so many ways. I've learned so much from him. He's like, pH dictates everything in your aquarium. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about it. Nobody wants to understand it, and I don't understand why. And I said, I want to understand it, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. I mean, we're doing some things that were not heard of in this industry, and people are still can't wrap their heads around it. But the people that are listening to my exact details on how to do it, mm -hmm. and again, 
mind explosion with their alkalinity going through the roof. And it's two weeks into it and people are going, man, I'm really starting to get nervous. I'm like, I told you, <laughs> how did your corals look? They look amazing. I'm like, hey, stop bothering. Stop worrying about it. Yep. You know, I get it because it's been what's instilled in every reefer for the last 20 some years. Mm -hmm. And it's a great marketing tool. In my opinion, it's a great way for, for companies to sell their alkalinity buffer, chase your alkalinity. Yeah. I'm, changing that narrative chase your ph folks because your corals will thank you for it they're not going to thank you when your alkalinity is constantly going up and down and up and down and all around because you're using an alkalinity buffer that is not stable in your system it just mm -hmm. basically is dissipated because you have too much carbon dioxide in your system because your ph is suppressed when mm -hmm. your ph is up there's less carb carb uh carbonic carbon acid. dioxide yeah. and carbonic acid so there's nothing that's fighting your mm -hmm. carbonates. There's nothing fighting everything else that's an element in your system. CO2 is a little devil, in mm -hmm. my opinion. It's the little devil nobody talks about. And it's like, you know, in your ear going, don't boost your pH. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, boost it. Get rid of it. Get out of here. You know, get and out of my tank. It works. It mm -hmm. really truly works. You know, when your pH and you, when, when any reefer reaches the stability that we've reached in our systems, you're going to look back and sit back and be like, Oh my gosh, I, 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 I've been doing it all wrong for a long time. And it's, it's going to make the entire reefing world. If people really start talking about it more that it's going to turn it upside down. I mean, mm -hmm. it's going to have a whole new way of thinking. I look at it this way. If you're not spending all that money on alkalinity buffer, how much money can you put on the corals in your aquarium? I mean, <laughs> that's the goal, right? We yeah. love our corals. It's true. We want more corals. It's all about the corals. You know, that's why we do you know, it. Exactly. We don't need to spend money on all this extra special, you know, all this extra stuff. And then there's the product for this and a product for that. And this one here does the same thing as this one here, but they label differently. I, I'm over all of that. Calcwasser, mm -hmm. calcium, magnesium, minor and trace elements. Yep. Done. Okay. Everything else. Oh, and natural means of exporting nutrients. So you'd add no chemicals to your tank because what is in the chemicals? What other byproducts are in them? You don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I learned along, you know, just, just recently, everybody says acros, it's just acros when they start using an RTN or STN, when everything else is looking amazing. No, 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 not true. Um, yeah. I learned a lot and that's something for the future, but it's, it's pretty interesting what's going on. It uh, has a lot to do with, um, sodium based salts, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, the, the raw materials that are being used for buffers and if they're pure enough or not, and if there is contaminants in them that, Build and build and build and build and build over time. And then, yep. oh, well, my aquas were doing great for a year and a half, two years. And all of a sudden, I started getting STN and RTN. I did a big water change and it all stopped. <laughs> yeah, what's a building up? Later, you don't know. Six months later, the same thing starts happening. Oh, my gosh, it's acros. It's acros. No, it's not. It's your water. It's impurities mm -hmm. in your water. It's impurities in, in, in things that are being added to your water. It's impurities that are in chemicals that are being used to, to take away your nitrates, to take away your phosphates. There's so many things that nobody talks about, and I don't care. I want to talk about it. The animals are more important than anybody making a dollar on this industry if they're not yep. putting a product on the market that's as pure as it can possibly be, and they're cutting corners to make profit. Yep. That's a problem for me, and if it upsets somebody for me bringing that up and putting Bring it, it out, I, really don't, I don't care. I don't yep. care. The animals are what makes them able to sell their product. Yep. So if the product is being cut corners on it to make more money on it, and those animals are dying because of it, why do yep. people get into the industry? Because they like the animals. If they get out of it because they have bad luck, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's true. People, it's a, I mean, it, it is. Successful I mean, reefers it, is good for everybody. So, exactly. I mean, it's good for the oceans. It's good for the world. It's good for, you know, science, even yep. though science doesn't want to listen to us. Um, I could teach some scientists a lot of things that they never even thought about. I'm sure of it. Um, but they don't, I don't have my credentials. So I'm nobody. <laughs> ah, maybe they'll watch this. Okay. Okay. So, so the, uh, like with the stream, I guess we're talking like coloring up corals, keeping healthy corals. So keeping healthy corals, number one, in your opinion, probably keeping a solid elevated pH. Um, I, I firmly believe that after yep. the year and three months of data that I have, um, seeing what I've done for the last 25 years of reefing to the last year and three months, I've never seen results that I'm seeing with what I'm seeing with the pH being um, elevated from being, well, okay. I said boost your pH. That's a that's something you can dissect that how you want to. 
I've changed my way of saying it and made it more refined. It's boost your suppressed pH. Yeah. I got people telling me that they're putting this, you know, they're boosting their pH to like 8.6, 8.7. I'm like, what are you doing? It's not what I said. Okay, uh, so on that note, what do you think is too high of a pH? Like what should you not push it past or go over? I have my Neptune set, uh, shut the whole dosing pump down if it gets to 8.5. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, again, if it's at 8.3, Happy. and that's what natural seawater used to be. Yep. That's where you should be targeting. Mm-hmm. If it's 8.4, that's 10 times as caustic, per se, as what the 8.3 is. You go to 8.5, that's 20. 8.4, yep. five, you keep going up. The higher you go, the risk is not worth the reward you're going to get because your reward might be complete and utter annihilation of your reef aquarium because I don't know what it's the threshold reward. is. And I don't yeah. want to find out what the threshold is. It's just like I don't want to know. I, I don't. I never could wrap my head around 500 calcium, 450 calcium. I don't understand that. Natural mm-hmm. seawater is at 390. Yeah. I say 390 to 420 at the most. I don't understand why you would just keep dumping money in your tank when your corals can't uptake it any more than what they can uptake. No. So it's pointless. Do you think there's an issue of it being higher? Like, is there any negative yes, effects? Of course there is. Yeah. Of of what calcium? Yeah. Oh my god. Mine's always high. So I'm curious. Really? I, okay. Oh my gosh, that's a big thing. I mean, it, it, if it, if it goes slow yeah. and steady, the chances of you having major issues, you know, um, are slim mm-hmm. because you know eventually you'll get to the point of complete, utter max saturation when it comes to magnesium and 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 alkalinity, and mm-hmm. you'll have this big snowing event that happens in your aquarium, and you know it'll dissipate itself out and turn into clumps at the bottom of your aquarium. Um, so, you know, that's the thing you, you, sh- you shouldn't have any, you shouldn't ever get to that threshold where you're having it start to STN and RTN your corals because yeah. of the chemical in- in- interaction that's going to happen with everything else in your system. So it basically will create a complete and utter imbalance of your water chemistry and it will correct itself. My, mine's always been elevated. So I, know I was just curious and uh, just from the <laughs> calcium reactor, right? So it, it just is what it is. I don't dose it specifically, but. I just have to look what it is now because I'm curious. I'm just, I think it was like 500 ish. I mean, 500. I mean, I, I I don't I don't I don't particularly ever get my calcium to that to that level. Um, um, if it's through, through your calcium reactor, that's a different story. If somebody's dosing a uh, liquid calcium buffer yeah. to get their out their calcium up there, um, the Benjamins every year <laughs> are going right down the toilet because it's not benefiting your corals in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Um, if it is, prove me wrong because. I don't see how it's possible because they can only uptake so much into their skeleton. And then, yeah. if, of course, if you've got your calcium at 500, your pH is suppressed. You're really pissing in the wind as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Question <laughs> in the chat. This made me laugh. Does he send an ICP test? Chris, how often are you ICP testing your tank lately? My buddy comes to my place that owns the ICP equipment every Friday morning at nine o'clock on the dot. So if I don't get all of the stuff <laughs> in my system that I want to make sure is where it's supposed to be by like seven thirty, then I don't. Then I know my test isn't going to be uh, where I want it to be because I don't have enough time to homogenize. So, so you weekly, have the week, the reefer's dream of weekly ICP tests. It is a dream. It is the dream. It's so much fun. That is awesome. I sit and spend hours analyzing all my systems from week to week and the, the trends. And, uh, you know, I know when we did water changes so I can see the difference in, in the, in the values of, of the majors, especially that's where you mm-hmm. see more. We add a lot of tr- minor and trace elements to our systems. Um, a lot of them actually. Um, and it's so interesting to see how a water change doesn't affect them Mm -hmm. but it's because of the fact that the water we're adding to it already has natural seawater values of all the minor and trace elements and then we continue to keep it um you know by adding amount small amounts of it on a daily basis so it keeps it stable so the the sodium ions the calcium ions the magnesium ions the potassium all that stuff is just it, it, it just goes like this weekly yeah, you know, and it, it, it's it's interesting to see. Um, it, it really see it the most when we do water changes. That's when we see the big differences in swings and and everything. But um, we're very fortunate. Whoever that call that that person that had that question was, we're very fortunate that we have yeah. the people on our side, and we've networked really well, and we've got a um, a machine an hour from our facility. That's awesome. 
has there what's like the biggest thing you've learned from being able to do weekly water or not water change weekly icp tests oh my gosh just how much certain minor trace elements just don't stay in your water and how, how fast they're they're being utilized by um the the uh bio the the biomass that's in your system i don't say coral because in all honesty i don't know exactly what elements are being uptaken by the corals themselves because with the icp machine being you know close and when we were in our beginning stages of him actually learning the machine um somebody came to me and said did you ever check what's in skin mate and i'm like hmm. no but now i'm curious i am too my, my friend well i can tell you what's in skin mate my you friend tell. gene um who is the physicist and owns reef labs yeah um he's like hey he, he said they didn't clean out your your skimmate buckets yet, did they? And I'm like, no, let's go back and get some. And we put some sludge into one of the vials. And um, it was funny because it took him like three weeks to get me the results because it was so nasty. He had to run it through an acid. Then he had to run it through a, <laughs> um, a 20 micron sock he thought was going to do the job. And then he had to actually order one micron socks to get all of the particulates out to actually be able to run it through the nebulizer in the machine. Yeah. But um. The guy that wanted me to do the test said, I bet you there's a ton of alkalinity, there's a ton of calcium and magnesium in there. And I'm like, I don't think so. And when we got the results back, we were all blown away. Because um, there was the only thing that was in it was every single minor trace element that we actually put into our huh. system every single day. Yeah. Hang on a second. What'd you say, buddy? Good night. <laughs> um, so... So it's so it is so not sucking up the majors, but just the trace elements. Trace elements, yes. Yeah. And something else that was really surprising for me is the amount of phosphorus found in the skin mate. Mm -hmm. Okay, phosphorus is a is a is, is what creates phosphate. Yeah. Okay, and I was always under the impression that the skimmer, from everything I always knew, that skimmers didn't do um, anything for phosphates. Um. It turns out they really don't do anything for phosphates, but they do remove phosphorus, mm -hmm. which is it, it helps to prevent phosphates from being created. But there's always going to be phosphorus in your water. So there's always going to be the right components there to create phosphates. It just helps to remove a little bit of the phosphorus so that it doesn't actually um, excel in your in your system yeah. as fast as it would without the protein skimmer. So it pre prevents some of the phosphates in a way. Exactly. It helps prevent phosphates, but it doesn't actually take them out. Hmm. Um, that's where my algae scrubbers come into effect. And I still swear by the algae scrubbers for my phosphate and my natural ways of doing things without adding chemicals to remove nutrients. Um, but um, the minor trace elements that were found in the most uh, copper, mm -hmm. Everybody's like, oh, you had copper in your saltwater in your reef tank? And I'm like, well, yeah. duh, you're supposed to have copper in your reef tank because copper is probably one of the most important minor elements to put in your water to make sure your photosynthesis is actually happening properly. So I get this weird look on people's faces when I tell them that. And I'm like, yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, I did get my ICPs back. You know, I'll show you. I'll, I'll put pure copper sulfate right in my system, right in front of your eyes. And they go, oh, I can't believe it. I'm putting three or four drops of pure <laughs> copper sulfate in my coral tanks. And yeah. uh, you have to it's do trace it. Element. You know, it's important. Mm -hmm. Minor trace elements are so unknown as mm -hmm. to what they do, but I know that protein skimmers remove them all. <laughs> and why do they remove them all? Well, that's the great thing about Gene because he's such an, a geek about it all. I'm going to learn exactly what is taking and the, the reason why the protein skimmer is uptaking and, and removing the, the minor and traces because our theory is it's bacterial and microbial. Uh, okay. Because when we started dosing minor trace elements, I had done one of those biome tests before all of this, and I did a biome test after I started doing the minor and traces, and my my uh, bacterial content dumped or dub uh, not doubled, it jumped from 586 to shit, what was it? 896. Yeah, that was how many more species of bacteria were growing in the <laughs> aquarium. So our theory is that the the bacteria are utilizing the minor and trace elements, which is beneficial to the corals because the corals are feeding on those bacteria. Yeah. And they're indirectly ingesting and utilizing these minor and trace elements and species of bacteria that wouldn't be present in your aquarium without that minor or trace element 
mm-hmm. won't be there. So it's giving your corals less variety of food, which is maybe part of the reason why Ganyaporas thrive and not just survive and deteriorate slowly. Mm-hmm. They just, I mean, our Ghanis grow like wheat. I yeah. mean, I'm I'm addicted to them again, all over. They are awesome. Ganyaporas, 96 different color morphs. Oh, love it. Okay. And it's so, growing. <laughs> so, okay. So if tray, if skimmers are pulling out trace elements, which in theory is a con, mm-hmm. I mean, the plus side is the oxygenization they provide, and they probably pull out some other nasties for nitrates and, I guess, bacteria and different things. Do you think it's more benefit? Actually, first question, are you still running skimmers in all your systems? I don't run them on my wild coral systems, um, yeah. mainly because I don't have the room to. I do need to figure that out uh, because mm-hmm. um, I'm going to correct, correct you on your um, one statement here. Uh, sorry, it. I don't mean to do correct, that. But- correct away. What everybody thinks about protein skimmers is that they add oxygen to your water. It's the biggest myth on the planet. It does not happen. Seawater can only be saturated with so much oxygen. Mm-hmm. And protein skimmers do not add oxygen. They scrub your CO2. Yeah, okay, That's fair. The main thing that they do. Yeah, and the fair. reason I know this is because when I had the uh, UF Aquaculture Lab out doing a test when I had gotten, I don't know if you remember the uh, King Eye Angelfish I took the reef of Palooza in 2018 or 19. Mm-hmm. Well, when I had a problem with that fish, they came out and they brought me, uh, they brought all kinds of um, lab equipment out to test, you know, the the system that I had it in for dissolved oxygen, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. And I said, hey, while you're here, I said, let's go, let's go do something. I have my protein skimmers off in the, in the farm in the back mm-hmm. because we were cleaning them and it's, you know, we're going to kick them back on, but they've been off for a few hours. Yep. I want to know what my dissolved oxygen is in that system. Mm-hmm. So we went back and checked it and we checked, we checked the CO2 level. Yep. And the CO2 level was through the roof. The dissolved oxygen level was like, this is very normal for natural, for seawater. This is a very normal oxygen reading. I said, okay. So um, when we were done doing the skip, I kicked it back on. They were there for another hour or two. And we mm-hmm. went back and the oxygen level didn't budge yeah. one bit. CO2, CO2 level, CO2 went, level went down went though. 50% of what it was. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes something sense. new. Mm-hmm. Oxygenation does not happen through protein skimming. It just scrubs your CO2. So that's why if you want a CO2 scrubber and you don't have a protein skimmer, you better put one on because that's the best CO2 scrubber. And everybody, most everybody has one on their, on their system. And that'll help with your pH being, keeping it from being as suppressed. Yeah. I mean, that's really what mine's on. If my protein skimmer is off, I see a huge dip in my pH. It is, it, 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 it's massive, like, especially because I have the CO2 media on it. Plus it's pulling outside air. There's a whole exactly. slew of stuff going through my skimmer. So it's, Oh, you did get the outside air pulled through. I think I don't remember talking to you about that, yeah. and I didn't think you could do it. No, oh no, I, I went up through the wall to the attic, nice. so it, it's pulling it from just like the peak where the vent is. So I got <laughs> like just a ten inch canister with just like a coarse filter just for like particles. Yep. And that comes in, and then I also took a Tupperware container that I put soda lime pellets in and put it on the top of my skimmer, and yep. I put a tea, so it's kind of a blend of fresh air from outside as well as the soda lime. So it kind of blends the two back into the skimmer. Awesome. Um, so. I had um, told another guy that he needs to put a because he was worried about um, them spraying around his rental property that he was living in. Yep. I said, just put a big old carbon canister on there and make sure that it has to go through the carbon and it'll, yep. it'll filter that stuff out. And he did it and he was blown away by just the pH boost that he got from putting the outside air into his into his protein skimmer. <laughs> you know, that's just something I always tell everybody too. you know, make sure you do all the other precautions you can possibly do to help. So you're not yep. overdosing calcwasser in your system because that's the biggest problem that I have with, with people. <clears throat> Is it doing too much? Yeah, people are adding the, – the, because of the double programming to dose double the amount, yep. they aren't actively putting in the line to go outside to help your pH from being suppressed by the inside air and being boosted by the outside air. So – <clears throat> when people can't achieve their goal and they're actually adding more than their evaporation, mm-hmm. I ask them if they did that. And if they say no, I say, okay, do that. And then yep. watch how much less you dose in calc washer the next night. And they're just coming back to me going, whoa, mind um, explosion. Yeah. It really, it dosed, you know, these guys are like a gallon to two gallons a day. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I was dosing like 2.3 gallons. And he's like, now I'm down to like 1.9 gallons. Just because yeah. I put the line outside, I'm like, <laughs> little things like that L- 
line outside, air exchanger on the house. I've done like many extreme things. I still need, in your page is still better than mine, but uh, it's like slowly creeping up over time. <laughs> I'm telling you, the only way you're going to achieve what we achieve is to do the method the way we do it. I don't know anybody else. Even Pierre at the Coral Corral, he's a stubborn mule. He's like, I'm going to do it this way. And I'm like, dude, you're never going to achieve it. Oh, mm -hmm. I'll get there. Finally, he's like, all right, come down and help me program it. <laughs> like, oh, it's only been three weeks. It's about time. You haven't reached your goal that you want to reach. And all right, I'll come and help you out. So yeah. um, I'm happy to help anybody. And I'm happy to help let anybody, you know, think that they can change my method and make it work. And nobody's been able to do it yet. And when somebody does, great. I want somebody to do it because mm -hmm. I've put a lot of effort into it. It's not going to hurt my feelings if it makes it better, you know? Yeah. So um, it okay. works. It's true. Okay. There's a question in the chat a little while ago before I forget to ask it. They're asking, would you keep your potassium at? And do you toast potassium? Because I know at one point, I think you sell the potassium hydroxide going in part of the hydroxide soup blend. It's part uh, of the soup blend still. Yep. What, so what level do you keep that one at? Or what level don't you let it go above? Like what's your okay. range? Um, because we get the weekly tests, I get to see the trends and how much, you know, potassium ions are being added with the tiny amount of potassium hydroxide that goes in our system. Mm -hmm. I like my potassium level between 420 and no more than like 470. Um, when you get to that, natural seawater is like around 399, 400, somewhere in that area, depending on the region of the world that you're in. Mm -hmm. So a lot of places like to say, you know, average, you know, keep it at like, you know, 410, 420. Yeah. Well, I did for a long time keep my levels at that. And I love the results I was getting from it. You know, the colors of the corals were just amazing. But I found that when the potassium hydroxide started going into the system, you know, you think your corals looked good at a 410, 420. Well, get it up there at about 470 once and wait and watch every color, like, phosphorus almost. I mean, they glow. It's like even the greens. You know, the most pronounced corals that we saw a big change in was we had problems with um, subtle colors in certain um, acroporas. And also some of the goniopores and some of the lobophilias were having some of the subtle colors that they would come in with would disappear. And when the potassium level got up um, to the, about the 450 range, we started really noticing a lot of that subtle colors coming back, even if it was gold or mm -hmm. blue. I mean, it was just like there was something about the extra potassium in the water that allowed everything to just pop. Yeah. So – I did get to as high as, uh, oh my gosh, um, I was I went three weeks without an ICP test because Gene's machine went down and he had to get a new part <laughs> for it. It took three weeks to get there. Actually, no, he's so good at what he does, he actually fixed the part mm -hmm. because he couldn't wait any longer. Anyhow, um, I ended up having uh, um, issues where I was dosing more of the potassium than I'm in that three week period. Of course, go figure. I'm not getting tested. I'm dosing more potassium hydroxide than I normally would dose. And my potassium level went to 520. Yeah. Everything still looked good, but I was to the point there where I was like, nah, um, I got to get this down. And then um, I got a new formula of salt that we are using that is for us only because of what we do. Mm -hmm. I've got some systems I strictly use the potassium hydroxide. I've got some systems I use a, a concoction of mm -hmm. three along with the, the, the calcium hydroxide and then others that are just using one of the other hydroxides in coordination with the Kalkwasser. Um, it's kind of been a balance. I've been trying to figure out on which ones I want to use my concoction on, which ones I want to use, you know, certain systems uptake the potassium a little bit more and it's usually the system that has more acros and for some reason the yeah. acros seem to utilize the cal the, the potassium more so be careful with potassium yep. it can be detrimental to your fish first hmm. i had a guy that was dosing the potassium hydroxide i taught you how to do it i taught one other person how to do it and i said i'm never teaching anybody how to do it again because yeah. <laughs> it scares me i don't want you guys having problems because there's a lot of things that you don't that you can't predict are going to happen and that's why i say to everybody you can achieve the goals as a hobbyist with calc Wasser. you don't need yeah. the other stuff that's mm -hmm. for somebody like me um yeah. so it's uh get your potassium level up a little bit and mm -hmm. actually there's a way you can do that without actually adding potassium chloride to your system um i mentioned the reef blueprint and the captivate aquaculture line um i've never been a fan of the sodium-based carbonates 
because of the fact that there is possibilities for certain impurities to be in them if they're not using the best raw materials. Mm -hmm. And um, one of them is very detrimental to acropores. It's called cesium. Um, mm -hmm. And it takes a while to build, but will cause major, major issues. Um, so we reformulated Chris, the genius that he is, reformulated a new buffer, which is a potassium-based carbonate buffer. And um, the first formula has been now tweaked three times so that we don't have to worry about um, hobbyists. I did all the testing on it for him yeah. Um, because I wanted to see, you know, after I put a four liter bottle of this alkalinity buffer in my system over a period of a month, how much potassium did it, how much did it raise the potassium level? And it was about 20 points. Okay. So I, well, if people continue to use that month after month after month after month, yeah, that's going to be a problem for the potassium levels in, in their system. So it's now been reformulated where you, you, we use one of the potassium salts and he sourced out high purity sodium salts for carbonates. Mm -hmm. So we have them combined together so that you have um, a, a really stable alkalinity buffer for nice. one and you get a little bit of extra boost from the potassium in it. So um, your corals will really pop after you've been using it for a while. Nice. And uh it's awesome. That's pretty cool. So this is called Reef Blueprints. Now, is this something that people can already get out of curiosity? Yes, they can. Okay. Yes, they can. Um, there's a few online sites, Reef Masters um, in Bradenton. Their website has it on. Um, we also have it on. There's a local um, aquaculture facility that sells it um, called um, Aquaholics Aquaculture. They're an aquaculture facility that we buy all of our phytoplankton and our copepods, our rotifers, our black worms, you know, a lot of different, um, you know, microfauna that she aquacultures. And she has, um, she sells it on her website. Um, nice. The full line is on the website. I think her and Reef Masters are the only two right now that have the full line on their website. Mm -hmm. um, the company's very new. I mean, yeah. it's I just learned year. about it, so... <laughs> Well, it was it was the it, Chris was the brainchild behind my boosting my suppressed pH, and now that yep. we've learned a lot and we re, we formulated a lot of the products like the 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 isolate MT, which is the minor and trace elements that we add, um, was reformulated. I, I can't even tell you how many times because of the ICP. Mm -hmm. You know, weekly ICP is okay. I'm adding this much of this every week. Okay, my 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 selenium levels are getting up there. We got to do something about that. My molybdenum levels are getting up there. We got to do something about that. So it was trial and error over what seven months of just backing off on some of the minor traces that are in the supplement in the values that they are in there. So that way the same things aren't happening to hobbyists. And without the ICP, I could have killed everything in my system because I would have never known what was going on and I've never been able to figure it out, but we knew where it was coming from because it was the only thing I was adding. So we helped to formulate it to its final formulation with mm -hmm. all that we've done for, you know, and Chris is, you know, great, grateful that, and Gene's been grateful for it too, because yeah. his tanks look amazing because he does, does my method. That, that's awesome. Okay. So we got pH number one. Now, assuming, you know, you got good lighting, good flow, what would, what's the next most important thing in your eyes? Honestly, I don't really worry about a lot of the other yeah, stuff. All that matters. pH, nothing else matters. I mean, <laughs> I, I worry about, well, here's the thing that people will notice when they start dosing the calc washer about five to six months into doing it. Now, again, I can say five to six months because that was my experience. Every yeah. system is going to be completely different in the way it reacts to it, but it will all react positively unless overdosing of the, uh, the, calc, the, the hydroxides dilute your water and you get a, you know, a suppressed salinity at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, you just got to watch everything and learn it. And once you learn it, you'll, you'll forget about everything else except for your calcium. Yeah. Um, and you'll, you'll monitor everything. But, you know, my calcium is my biggest hurdle right now mm. because the corals grow so fast in the farm. I literally go through – I add four cupfuls of calcium chloride anhydrous <laughs> yeah. um, in a solution. Mm -hmm. I do that one time a week. It takes all day for that solution to go into my system, huh. and it only raises my calcium from 390-ish because I don't like it going below the 390 mark. Mm -hmm. So it raises up to about the, about the 410 to 420 mark, and a week later, it's back down to being – you know, I'm like – You're once a week I, dose. <laughs> well, now that I've got the calcium reactors dialed in, I have to add about two and a half cups. Mm -hmm. It's not as much. Um, because the calcium reactor does add, add a decent amount of calcium to the system. Yeah. So um, that's going to be what everybody notices. When your alkalinity balances back out, 
Yeah. And when that will be, I can't tell you because I still have, it'll be a year in March mm -hmm. when I started my last system and the Alcone is still at 11.5. Now, but I haven't anything. Do you think your L can be too high? At what point were you like, okay, that's too far? Um, I've never had an alkalinity go to 13.6. <laughs> I, I was so <laughs> concerned about that. Yeah. And, you know, Chris is so good about just saying, dude, what are you worried about if your corals look happy? Yeah, I mean, it's fair. I mean, if you know your corals, you'll be able to see when they're happy or they're pissed off, basically. I think what bothered me the most was it was on an, uh, one of my wild coral systems where I where I import corals and mm -hmm. I put them directly into the system. And I was like, well, what's going to happen when I take the corals that are coming from basically natural seawater and put them in a 13.63 DKH right from, the, right from the bag straight into the system? What's going to happen? I said, guess what? I'm going to find out here soon enough, aren't I? And I never saw some of the corals that were usually really tough to – get to come around seem mm -hmm. to come around a little bit quicker but huh. i don't think it has anything to do with the alkalinity i think it has everything to do with the ph very well could be because i mean you know most people are like you know avoid the big elk swings but maybe if the ph is happy it's less impactful right exactly i mean that the p the alkalinity in that system when i started when i finally got the, it took about a week to get the ph to the 8.29 mark or it was not going to ever fall below it um with the dosing mm -hmm. and it took it about a week and a half to actually get to 13.63. But the first week it went from my normal 8.3 to like 11.5. <laughs> That's a good job. Like in like a day or two. Yep. And I, at that point had already had my head, you know, programmed not to worry about that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But when it started going farther, it was when it started to get concerned. But now, now we're, O overall, it was obviously good, but was there any corals that didn't react positively to that? I can't tell you that I saw any issues with yep. any corals. I mean, and we nice. have a smorgasbord of coral in that aquarium from soft corals all the way up to, you know, pasillopores. I don't keep as I don't keep acros in that system because there's not enough light over those over those tanks for me to justify putting them in there to turn them brown. Yep. Um, so <laughs> they, they stay in a particular system. Um, uh, Amanda, yeah. don't let him fool you. He was freaked out at first. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I was completely freaked out. Um, but now that it's been a year, I'm so relaxed on parameters. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what bothers me when I have a power outage and it's for more than an hour or two because I know what's going to happen to my pH because there's yeah. not going to be anything dosing my system. No battery and backup for your dosing of your pH? <laughs> Um, no, cause then I'm really not in control <laughs> of the control, <laughs> yeah, <fair. laughs> but, um, you know, it's, um, uh, it's amazing how much more relaxed people will be by just watching and monitoring their pH and filling up their calcwasser vessel once a week, twice a week, whatever size vessel you can use. I mean, heck the one guy was like, I can only put a two gallon container underneath my tank. I'm like, well, how far away is your garage? And he's mm -hmm. like 25 feet. And I'm like, okay. Can you run a line through the wall? And he's like, I can, but it would be outside then. And I'm like, so what? It's 25 feet away. You're pulling with the pump. Yeah. Why does it matter if it's right next to your tank or if it's outside? I'm like, plus I'm sure your wife's not going to be disappointed if you put the cock foster vat right there in the corner of your, of your garage and it's not in the way in a closet or in your house or in a bathroom. Put it outside. Plus then there's no mess. If you spill a whole bunch of water, it's in the garage. Yeah. And um, he did it and he's like, wow. So I'm blown away. Six grams per gallon. If the caulk washer is of high purity, six grams per gallon will dissolve completely in water. Now, RO water. Is there any specific caulk washers that you recommend of being high purity? I, I only use one. I mean, Wh I've been is? through the <laughs> reef, reef blueprint. Okay. I mean, yep. okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about reef blueprint only because it's all I use in my system anymore. Um, there's a lot of good brands out there, and I can't knock any of them. I, I don't know anything about the majority of them. What I do know about some of them, I could never call anybody out because mm -hmm. it just like you know just isn't me. Yeah. But uh, there is some brands out there that are not of high enough purity, and I've had just, I've had this issue when I tell everybody how to how to mix up their calc washer. Everybody thinks you just dump a cup of it into it and, and let this let it settle down, and then you clean out the vat at the bottom. 
why are you throwing away your money? Because that undissolved caulk washer will dissolve as soon as you put more water back in with it. And it's the, it's another misconception about caulk washer. It's not messy like everybody thinks it is. If you do it right, it's no different than mixing up your own alkalinity buffer mm-hmm. or mixing up your own calcium from the dry supplement. You know, it's it's no different if it's done properly. Yeah. But that's the thing. I'm the same way. I'm like, you know, get the bag. I know what I'm doing and I don't read the directions. Read the damn directions on everything you ever use in your aquarium. If you don't read the directions, it's your own fault if something happens. Because the directions on most of the products will tell you exactly what you need to do. (laughs) If you don't follow those directions and something happens to your aquarium, you're the only one that's at fault for it. And I'm talking (laughs) to all reefers out there because you all do it. I know it. (laughs) Spend the five minutes to read the label. (laughs) It, It can save you countless animals. And in some people's eyes, it can save them a ton of money. I look at it in the animal side of it. The money is, you know, a whole different game, but the animals are what we do this for. Mm-hmm. And if we're killing them because we're not reading simple directions, then you can't blame anybody but yourself. Can't blame the product. Yep. You know, and I had somebody blame my one product or the one captivate product for a problem they were having. And I'm like, how much are you dosing and, and how often? And he told me, and I knew the product, you know, I know it like the back of my hand. I'm like, you didn't read directions. Did you? No, I went by what I was told from some, da, 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 da. I'm like, okay, so, you're the reason the problem happened in your aquarium, not the product. You didn't do it properly. So quit bashing something when it was your when it was a fault. And that's the biggest problem I think for reefers to have too, is to admit their faults. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. I don't know. We are all always learning. If, if anyone ever claims to know it all, they're lying. Always they're constantly lying. learning. Always. If, if I ever get to the point where I think I know it all, I don't want to be in the industry anymore. Yep. Because then it's no more fun. It's true. That, that's, I think that's why we like this, though, is because it's a challenge and because you are always learning. Like, you can constantly experiment and learn something new. Completely brain food. Every morning, the brain food that comes in, it's like, you know, it just feed my brain more information. What did I learn? What is different today than it was yesterday? Oh, exactly. Why? That's why? one of the reasons I love doing these live streams. I learn every week. I learn brand new things that I never thought of considered. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, never know it all possible so much fun i mean you know I, I, i've told my wife this i've told everybody that I, that i that knows me you know i don't ever want to stop learning and and if i like i said if i do i don't want to do it anymore i need to go into something else that can you know feed my addiction to something else um mm-hmm. because it is an addiction it really truly is if there was a thing called coral anonymous i'd probably <laughs> be the the head of it <laughs> <laughs> exactly okay so so we're all addicted um yep. PH, super important. Keep it high. You got you got our basics. How important do you think trace elements are to dial in or pay attention to, to dose? I don't know enough about it yet, but mm-hmm. what I do know about it is I think they I think we're gonna find over time that we're gonna find that they're 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 extremely important. Because just doing the biome test and seeing mm-hmm. what it was before traces and then what it was after traces, I mean, if that doesn't click in anybody's head as being good. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to talk to that person about because that is just amazing to me that the bacteria that are being populated in your aquarium because they need those particular elements to actually thrive in your mm-hmm. system. And we didn't add that species of bacteria to the tank. It came Found because away. The, the, right, the, right, the right stuff was there for it to actually thrive. And the benefits from having all that extra bacteria in the system, does it help with color? I don't know because it's just too much involved with me to be able to tell you somebody that. Do I see a difference in my corals in their colors because of what we've been doing to our systems? 100%. Yeah. But where, where is the – how do I say it? I mean the, where is the end of the line when you are talking about the trace elements do you mm-hmm. do you target every single one of them or do you only target certain ones and you know how many different bacteria are utilizing multiple trace elements to thrive mm-hmm. and without one of them they don't survive well you know, if bacteria you know if bacteria is eating the trace elements and the corals are eating the bacteria i mean that's one way that they're getting into the corals right um, i've been saying this a lot lately if the shoe fits right yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's not fact, it's science, Yeah. because there is no fact 
in science. It's all a theory. Yeah. And the ultimate goal is to get the facts. But just like Einstein, you know, and all of his theories and everything that we we swear by, there's no doubt in my mind that they're all going to be debunked one day down the road. And they're going to be mm -hmm. elaborated upon down the road. And what we thought we knew, we're going to know more someday. Yeah. And that's the great thing about science. And anybody that thinks that, you know, science is the exact you know, doesn't understand science and, you know, mm -hmm. it, it goes to every aspect of science. And uh, again, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a biologist. I'm just a guy that loves what I do. And I have great people on my team to help me in every, every step of the way. I can't talk all the crazy lingo, but I can at least understand most of it. And I can, mm -hmm. you know, be able to put a decent head behind how to do something and theorize about it and yeah. then put it into practice and, give some results. And that's what this is all about is slow and steady wins the race, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with minor and trace elements, because yep. so many of them can be so toxic if they're just overdosed no, by a little bit. Yep. Yeah. A little bit of an overdose can wipe a copper. I talked about it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Wonderful in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> Nine parts per billion. Mm -hmm. I've been as high as like 12 parts per billion. That's getting too high for me. So, yeah he, you know, stopped dosing some MT there for a while. And I think the reason why was I did something stupid and I turned off my, uh, my algae scrubber and completely forgot I did that because we had a completely bottom out of the, um, phosphates mm -hmm. and it was all for like a week and my copper level rose yeah. you know, among a couple of other things. And I'm going, what the heck is going on? So I'm starting to look around at everything and you dumbass, you didn't turn your freaking algae scrubber back on. <laughs> well, that's you know? going to be sucking out the copper as well. I mean, it's also sucking out trace elements. More than anybody even co can possibly imagine. I mean, the, the the algae scrubber and the algae growing on the scrubber is sucking out trace elements like crazy. And the whole reason why we started playing with trace elements is because we found that there was no trace elements in my water whatsoever and my scrubber <laughs> wasn't put. Because <laughs> you have a massive scrubber sucking them all out. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't pulling phosphates anymore. Like it was consistent for six or eight months. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it just stopped. And my phosphates just started going up and up and up. And I, my algae was growing, but there was no phosphate uptake. And that's when I started looking into it more. And that's when Chris said, well, what are your minor and trace elements like? And I'm like, there's not, nothing showing that I know of. He's like, uh, let me send you this new thing down that I've been working on formulating for your algae turf scrubbers. Mm -hmm. So we did. And that was the original version of the minor and trace. And now it's been tweaked so many times to be where it is today. Nice. And um, it works amazing. That's awesome. Keeps everything, keeps everything dialed in. Yep. Okay. Another question. Uh, feeding corals. Do you feed your corals? A lot. <laughs> okay. A lot. Yep. Um, is it something specific or is it like the kitchen soup of variety? Um, we have, depending on our phosphate levels. Mm -hmm. we, we feed our corals particular foods depending on what the phosphates are in our system. Um, I love reefroids. Reefroids was yep. one of the first foods that I really saw results with. And it's, it's, a, it's a great um, all-around food. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use it as frequently um, because they were part of the reason why I had some issues with elevated phosphates mm -hmm. because of the amount that I was feeding. On a hobbyist level, you're not going to see what I saw. We were going through five-pound buckets of reefroids every three months. And that's a lot of doggone reefroids. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> and <clears throat> so um, I still use reefroids on, on a weekly basis, but in moderation because I don't want my phosphates you know, being too elevated too quickly. Um, so we use a concoction. Um, if my phosphate levels are above a certain level, when we do our test on, um, the days we feed, um, we don't put any reefroids in our concoction of food. Mm -hmm. If they're zero or they're like 0 0.02 or 0 0.03, um, then we put in a ratio. And if it's like 0 0.05, 0 0.06, we put in another ratio. And yeah. the more we, you know, when we're really low, we put a lot of reefroids in because we got to get some phosphates back in there. And it's funny because we do see a big difference in the corals response method when the reefroids are all when when they're in the concoction. Mm -hmm. It is something about that product that it really makes the corals respond extremely well. Now I have the Captivate Aquacultures Integrate um, Reef, which mm -hmm. is a all-around coral food, mm -hmm. and it is 
the, the growth in color we've gotten from just that. I mean, we got great response from the refloids, but when we started using the, the integrate, we started getting some weird colors popping out of just common green acan lords or micro lords. Oh, All they the babies, love to be fed. Love it. Oh, my gosh. Devin, the, the, the single polyp green and purple micro lord yep. is like nobody wants them anymore. Well, people do, but not nearly like if, it was. But, and, but the micro musa, if you take one that never gets fed, and you feed it, it could look like a completely different coral in a couple of months. Like the colors you get out of them when you feed them well is amazing. It is. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's totally amazing. That's the thing. You know, we fed refloids to them and the babies were, were growing and they were definitely a different color than the, than the adult, the, the original polyp. But when we started feeding this other, this integrate food that Chris developed, um, we turned a B grade Lord into a rainbow Lord in like three months. Yeah. I mean, full blown, just what? <laughs> Where did those colors really cool. come from? It's amazing <laughs> what it, some good nutrition can do. <laughs> it is. I mean, I, I tell everybody, feed your corals as much as your system will allow you to, okay. according to the means of your filtration. Okay. okay, okay. Now, on that note, what do you consider feeding too much? Like, how high is too high for nitrates and phosphates? I mean, uh, every system is different, Devin. I mean, it all depends on what your light know, is. but just, and... just general. Like, in, in your tanks, at what point is... T- What's your high level where you don't want to hire for nitrate and phosphate? Okay. Um, on my wild coral systems, which are relatively lower in light than most of the other systems, mm-hmm. I have a phosphate level that goes as high as like, um, I think the last time on my ICP, it was point, point 0.25 okay. was the one wild system. Now yeah. the other wild system which is where i keep my acros and it's usually a lot more dense in coral population that one's usually right around uh 0.15 mm-hmm. and my nitrates are usually between 40 and 60 on those two systems now again that's fairly low light so when you balance your light with mm-hmm. your nutrients i mean i have sps in that tank where i have a 0.15 phosphate and a 60 ppm of um, nitrate but I used to have lights that were giving me about 380 to 400 um, par. Yeah. And now I put the coral carriers up, which I absolutely love. Mm-hmm. They're a lower light, but the light is more consistent. Mm-hmm. And because of it only being like 270, my acros have never looked better from the time I import them until the time they leave my doors. They yeah. stay colored and just phenomenal. So, so go ahead. High, higher nutrients, but lower par on those. Higher nutrients means you need lower light on yeah. your system. If you want to run really high light, you need mm-hmm. to make sure your nutrients stay stay on the lower side. And there is a threshold of browning out your acros or keeping them colored when you have high light. And there's also a threshold when you have low light and browning out your acros with high nutrients. Yeah, It's a balance that the, every reefer is going to have to learn how to figure that out themselves because – I tried teaching people how to do it, and they, they got things roughly where I was, but Everything's they didn't have different. the same results. Yeah. And I can give you guidelines. Yeah, they're, they're general rules. I mean, every tank, you're going to have to find your own sweet spot. Now, I guess the other question to go with this, to give it context, wh- what par range, I guess, would you consider you know, medium, lower medium versus high? Honestly, I, I don't even like don't even the know. word par. Yeah, I, know. I, I don't. I don't, I can't wrap my head around it because it, it, it's, it's a number, it just is. like alkalinity is a number. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it doesn't mean anything if your corals aren't happy. Yeah. So I just like to always say, it's, I go back to the same thing when I talk about alkalinity, you know, who cares what your par is? Do your corals look happy? Yeah. Are they healthy? Are they, are they, are, do they look like they're the color they should be? Mm-hmm. Um, Corals will tell you everything you need to know about your system, the light, the flow, the water quality. Yeah. You can talk about all these numbers all you want and chase them all you want. But if your corals aren't happy, what's the point in wasting your time? Mm -hmm. I mean, in reality of it all, reefers focus too much on these numbers. numbers. And it it, it, it stresses me out thinking about (laughs) thinking about numbers anymore. Now that I've learned what I've learned about what so, I learned. <laughs> okay, so here, here here's the difference though. You are seasoned and you know what to look for for a coral being happy or not happy. 
Lo Super lots cool. of newer people, your first couple of years, I'm going to say after three or four years of reefing, you kind of get the feel for it. You can look at corals, you kind of know if they're happy or not. But up until that point, I don't think a lot of people have that skill. So I think that they rely on the numbers in lieu of it. But that, that's my theory on it. But in reality, it's, it's, it's like, you know, um, uh, because they were never taught, you know, if, if, if from the beginning, if, if all they're learning is the numbers, that's all they're ever going to want to know. Yeah. If they learned what corals should look like and the species mm. that they purchased and they aren't just buying it because it's pretty and they actually research the animal themselves, you get a little bit of learning out of it for one. And two, you don't have to worry about all these numbers in your head because you can actually look at the coral and see that it is okay. I, I took a picture of it when I bought it at the shop. Yeah. Okay. Cause it was beautiful. It was blown up like a balloon. And the colors were great. Take that picture, come home. And if it doesn't look like that in your aquarium, Okay, what good do those numbers do if those numbers are what you're supposed to be in if your coral doesn't look the same as what it did when you bought it? Yeah. So there's a lot of ways you can. Oh, oh, oh I, okay. I, I okay. understand what you're saying completely, but if I, I think people need to. Go ahead. You're, you're right. They do. They do need to learn this skill. But if I, I'm a new hobbyist, newer, I, I pick up a coral because it's pretty, then I take it home and research it because, of course, no one does the research first. They do it after. They're like, I got this. Now, how do I care for it? Um, and it, they know it's not in their prime, but I don't think a lot of people know how to get it to their prime. And I think that's why a lot of people rely on the numbers because they're like, this is where it should be. It's there. Why isn't it happy? Right. I'm going to say this right now. Yep. The reason why people don't ever get their corals to look like they should is because they worry about the damn numbers. <laughs> yep. I mean, I, nobody ever talks about pH. Why? Is there a reason why? Is there, is there an, is there a reason why nobody talks about pH? I, I can't stop talking about it because I want everybody to understand it, that it is the most important parameter. And it will dictate everything that goes on in your aquarium instability-wise. Yeah. And if this becomes something that is a norm in the industry as, some, as a talking point for people that are getting set up in the, in the industry and people learn how to do this simple, easy, cheap, cheap, method <laughs> right from the beginning mm -hmm. they'll understand what their corals are supposed to look like because their ph will already be where it needs to be and the rest of the numbers aren't going to mean anything because <laughs> when your ph is suppressed your corals are not happy mm -hmm. it isn't they really yep, are it's true they're much happier when it's high so high as in natural seawater which is 8.3 ish 8 .3. I, I tell people to target 8.25 to 8. Two nine for their pH set point, and when it rises above that naturally because of photosynthesis, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll they'll really notice that the biggest difference is the the expansion of the polyps, and um, this overall health of the animals and how fast they're growing. <sighs> the, the growth will blow people's minds. What do you got? Mine's at eight point two three right now. I had a look, but this is like my high right now, not my low. Still, so much better than most people get. Eight, I mean, eight point oh nine is my low to eight point two three in the last twenty four hours. Oh my gosh. If I showed you my, I, I, I have to screenshot my graph and send it to you. You'll be like, "What? I it know. looks like this big jagged, you know, thing." But because the the the, the oh, swing the is so little, <laughs> it makes it look like there's this big swing in it, but it's really only like point three, point four, yeah, and it's a good place it's to be. Pretty awesome. It is. It's a very good place to be. I know how to keep it from going up above the eight point three, but I refuse to dump sugar in my tank. What What does the sugar do? It's carbon dosing, so oh, okay, um, okay, okay. It, it, it just bacterial populations build real quickly, and it sucks out the the O2, which then yeah. helps to suppress the pH a little bit. So I have a guy in Australia that's a biologist and a scientist, and he gets the pH to stay at 8.3, like a flat line. I'm going, I want to do that. And he's like, well, you got to do this. And I'm like, oh, forget it. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I just won't. I okay. won't put it. That's adding something that's not natural to my system, and that's not what I do. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, I have another question. You don't have to say if you don't want to, but I know you have a concoction of hydroxides. The only ones I know of are potassium and sodium. So what are these other magical hydroxides I have not learned about? <laughs> um, there's one more that we use, and it's unobtainable anyhow. Okay, so, um, I, And also, and that one really can mess your stuff up if you use too much of it. Um, okay. so, we're talking so we about don't know about it. <laughs> I think I use 2.25 grams of it in my, in my concoction. Okay. Which is like nothing in your systems. Okay. 
No, that that'll last. But I, that goes in the concoction of um, the other two that I use. And you you mentioned the other two, sodium and potassium. Okay. Um, they're just not something for people to play with. Um, That's God, it scares me that people even play with that stuff. Uh, one drop every three seconds. Remember that. Yeah. One drop every three seconds is all I add to a twenty two hundred gallon tank to make the pH go from an, a suppressed at eight point one to an eight point three. Just just as a you shouldn't play with mm-hmm. this thing, the solution that I had would actually eat through the plastic of the dosing pump. And it, it, yeah, it did over time. So after a few months, I literally had to replace the like plastic tubing because it like ate through the connector. I was like, you know, I this bought, potent stuff. But, what I bought for my tanks, and it's expensive as all get out because it won't get eaten. <laughs> I bought Teflon tubing. Yeah. At two dollars and fifty cents a foot. Oof. Yeah. And it's rigid like RO line. Yeah. So you know, it once it's there, it's there. I'm not, you know, at least I'll never have to replace it because that was my big concern too. Because Chris told me if you're using vinyl tubing and yeah. not silicone tubing, yep. he's like the vinyl tubing will get really hard mm-hmm. and then just all of a sudden get micro cracks in it, and then one day just disintegrate. Yeah, I was and, like, why is this dripping in my stand? I realized <laughs> it ate to the connector. I'm like, yep, this is nasty stuff. I actually it just it makes me laugh because I haven't dosed in ages, but I still got my glass container up there and I have a skull and crossbones. I put a vial of nickel on it. I'm like, nasty stuff. Stay away. <laughs> I wanted to see what would happen if I stuck um if I stuck a um um a, a, a piece of algae that was off the scrubber into the uh, a little thing of cal- of potassium hydroxide max yeah. concentrated. I wanted to see how long it would literally take for it to disappear in there. Mm-hmm. And I put it in and I came back like five minutes later and I'm like. Are you kidding me? Gone. Like it was literally what gone, and it just discolored the the solution. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. That time I got it on my thumb when I first started playing with it, and it took two months for my thumb to stop cracking and bleeding. Made me really get scared of this stuff. And yeah, it, it, I was it, it, gloves and goggles and Walter White style when I was dabbling at one point. But um, just out of curiosity, have you tried adding it to the? Calquaser solution in very small concentrations. That's my next step. Okay. I really would like to do that. So um, I'm dosing with one pump versus two, mm-hmm. but um, I have to. Um, I, th- I talked to Chris about it, and he's trying to create the formula of, and the ratios of how much I need to add together mm-hmm. in order for it to not fall out of solution. Because yep. if you add too much of one and not enough of the other, you can have precipitation happen. And I don't want precipitation. I want the solution to be crystal clear when I'm dosing it. And, yep. you know, and I can look in my buckets that I mix up and say, oh, that looks like it's nice crystal clear water. <laughs> mm-hmm. Little do you know, it'll melt the flesh right off your bones. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I have not dabbled in it, but I've debated if I put just, you know, a very small concentration either into like the ATO bin or something just for that extra minute dosing for removing those extra carbonates. Yeah, well, when you learn, when you do my method of dosing calc washer, your ATO bin will go away and it'll go to the closet and you'll actually probably sell it because you won't ever need it again. Or that's your bin. Or that's to your caulk bin. Yeah. Okay. So you, a, a lot of people say ATO bin and I'm thinking they have a caulk stir. I'm just been hearing that so much. I'm I have, like, a, I have one of those too, but I still have a 40 gallon bin that has a tube going all the way to the tank. So either way. You're in good shape then because the only problem with the 40 gallons on how many, how many gallons do you evaporate? Uh, good question. I don't know. I'm I'm dosing probably five or five liters a day right now just through the calc stir. And the ACL stick kicks on a little bit though. Okay. Um do yourself a favor and get me your exact evaporation in twenty four hours. Yep. And then I can teach you how to use the calc washer on the dosing pump and then you'll just, you know, watch the magic happen. Mm hmm. No, so. that's true. <laughs> I I may have to dab with this now. Every time we talk I always have more experimenting to do. <laughs> So I guess we were, um, you know, kind of digressed a lot from what you originally wanted to talk about. Um, uh, well, I that guess was your fault. you asked me the questions. <laughs> yeah, one question, a whole new rabbit hole. But I mean, the main topic was keeping healthy corals, which this all plays into it. So it's still on topic. Um, yeah, and exactly. the other part of it was coloring up corals. I mean, really keeping healthy corals is going to aid in coloring them up. So we're, we're still on topic. <laughs> we are. You're right. I agree. Um, yeah. So. I think um, healthy corals um, are a perception by every individual reefer. Yeah. And what you perceive as healthy compared to what I perceive as healthy is completely different, I'm sure. And I think that 
you know, if you think your corals are healthy, that's great. And if there's a way that somebody else sees that it's different, I think everybody needs, everybody as a reefer needs to be open to the fact that what they're doing is working, Mm -hmm. but is there a way, is there a better way? And can I make my corals thrive and not just survive, survive and look healthy? And that's what we're working on. And the results with color, with growth, with every aspect of the system and maintaining it has changed completely with, you know, what we're doing Mm -hmm. and a lot cheaper. Yeah. I hate that's always a bonus. Now, like that's a good point that you said, right? Everyone has a different perception of what is healthy. And I think a chunk of that is one, you see a bazillion coral. So you have a pretty broad spectrum of seeing everything in different States versus, you know, people have their, 20 corals and what they see. So that's definitely something again, that comes with time. It is. It's something that does come with time. And it's, you know, if anybody's an avid, you know, avid about what they're doing and really loves what they're doing and loves these animals and is fascinated by them and trying to make them better than what they already are is going to always be open to, you know, making sure that they're in the best environment they can be in. I mean, they deserve it. I mean, we rip them out of the ocean. We're aquaculturing them in a facility. They deserve to be in the best environment. You know, and I've had some people that had customers that basically treated them like almost like a goldfish bowl. And I'm like, you know what? Why would you sell somebody that just wants, that doesn't want to do anything to the aquarium and wants to have, um, you know, just feed the corals, feed the fish, and then they cry and complain when they wasted all their money on the corals because they all died? You know, you had to be dedicated, in my opinion, if you are going to put a reef tank in your home. Yep. And if you're not dedicated to being and learning the process of keeping these amazing animals alive, don't do it because I got no sympathy for anybody that wastes their money and doesn't put time and effort into this, into this hobby. It's mm-hmm. rewarding as all get out. If you just feed your brain with some information to learn how to, how to take care of it. Yeah. hundred percent. Now. So, cause you aquaculture corals now on top of the stuff we talked about, is there anything that you would do to try and color up a coral more or try and get it to its prime? Cause obviously, you know, if you're selling corals out, you want them to look amazing, right? Yes. I mean, what would I do? I mean, you know, I tell you what I do um, all the time, but, you know, it's, it's the thing is, is every one of my systems is so different, you know, and I can get, you know, a coral to color up more in one system, but then color down in another system. Mm-hmm. And, but the other corals that are in that system are doing extremely well. So how, how, how can I even answer that question to, in, in an honest way? Because I, I don't, there's too many variables involved from system to system to really give a definitive answer as to what colors up corals. Yep. Um, I, I have to say that the, the thing we've been talking about the most is going to be one of the biggest factors in it. And then it's just a matter of, um, you know, learning where corals are happy, mm-hmm. you know, just putting a coral in your aquarium and it looks good. Doesn't mean it's going to be um, at its, at its peak of, you know, color and health because you like that spot for that coral. Well, yep. again, I go back to that coral is going to tell you if it likes that spot or not. It's true. And if it doesn't, you have to be open to be able to move that coral somewhere else to try to make it look better and make it thrive and do better. Mm-hmm. So I have acros that I grow in a system that has, you know, 200 par. Again, I bought a par meter because people ask me what my par level is on my acros. And that's the only reason <laughs> I bought the darn thing. So I can actually give them a number to yeah. make them happy. Um so I, I got acros that I can put in the, under the 200 par, and then mm-hmm. I can put them back under the 650 under the metal halides, and I won't get any differences. But that's because the difference in the other parameters in the system, mm-hmm. the nutrient levels are higher. So I'm keeping color. Go ahead. Okay. Now, you have the coral care. So you got LEDs on one, you got halides on another. Do you have both halides and LEDs on the same tank system? And have you tried corals you know under different lightings in the same water parameters and have you noticed much of a difference in that respect this is not going to make a lot of people happy that are led lovers um i i really <laughs> love the coral cares yeah. um okay i have what seven systems in my place you know mm-hmm. like 20 some thousand gallons of water running and i was a i've always been an advocate for metal halides and t5s and it took a lot for me to even be convinced to even try an LED as the main light source over something. I mean, the LED accents like Reef Bright, you know, XHO strips, love them to death. Mm -hmm. Love any accent strip that I can get my hands on. But as the main source of light, I just was hesitant. And 
I put the coral carriers over the acro system. Mm-hmm. The one tank, the rest of the systems have T5s and metal halides over it, but that one tank had the coral carriers over it. And the results were amazing on the on the on the corals. And again, it was again balancing the light and the nutrients, which I think was the key. Mm-hmm. And so I bought Oh gosh, I don't even know how many coral cares we have right now. Um, I still have like another forty of them to put up when the new farm gets put in. But I put coral cares and reef rights over my new farm because I was really happy with the results from the coral cares. Yeah. And that system's a year old. Well, just turned a year old. As a matter of fact, this week, um, mm-hmm. it just turned a year old. So happy birthday, Tank. <laughs> <laughs> system. Yep. It, it, <laughs> the, the the final phase of that system is supposed to be done this week, but it probably won't be done until next week. But it's going to be like over a five thousand gallon system. Um, it was started up with the coral cares and the um, reef bright LEDs. So it was a my first system with 100% LEDs over it. What I did was I started removing farm corals from the farm in the back because I'm trying to make space to put corals I know would thrive back there that I wouldn't want to put over in the new system yet. So I took mm-hmm. out my my euphilias, my my euphilia collection that I grew from a two foot by two foot area of single polyps of torches and hammers and frog spawns when Indonesia shut down. And I grew that out. It was like a four foot by two foot area of euphilias with multiple heads instead of singles. I started breaking them down and putting them in my new farm. Yep. Doing amazing. Um, I put them in, I think in like May as of July, I started losing a single head of a torch here. Uh, well, okay. A single coral light. Mm-hmm of a torch here, a single correlate of a torch there. And I'm scratching my head because the ICP, I'm getting them every week. Okay. Yeah. So I know it's not my water. What is it? And Tulio from Reaprite came down and started measuring all the, you know, spectrums of all my lights. And we, we came to the conclusion that it's, it's, it's either infrared mm-hmm. or UV being not being present because of the LEDs. So I, he's like, take one of those torches that's starting to look rough and put it in the back. Mm-hmm. Under your metal halides and T5s again. See what happens. Within a couple of days, the thing was, boom, wide open, acting like nothing ever happened to it. Oh. Like, hmm. And then I noticed this weird black algae that was growing on the tile that I don't have in any, other, in any of my other systems. It's only in the system with the LEDs. Mm-hmm. It disappeared. Yep. Hmm. Scratching my head. Why? Interesting. Why? Why, mm-hmm. why, 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 why? So um, I came to the conclusion that we're missing infrared and UV, so I put metal halides up in between my coral cares, and I stopped the problem. Hmm. Do you think so, it's whatever UV or infrared, whatever one of those LEDs can't produce it? Yeah, LEDs don't produce UV. They don't produce infrared. Yeah. Um, I saw it with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. I even saw the one the the, the Kessel AP9X that has UV UV properties to it, but it's, it's so it's weak. near UV. It's not pro- true UV. No, it it actually gives you three hundred. Three hundred eighty-five nanometers. I saw it with really high-tech equipment. It's okay. there. Yeah. Um, it was three hundred eighty-five nanometers, but it's so weak that the air between your light and your water <laughs> just sucks it up, el- eliminates <laughs> it. You know, it's gone. So, what light has UV? There's only one. I mean, it's metal halide, mm. and we measured the metal halides, and we were at three hundred and fifty micromoles of. Um, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Down to 350 nanometers at 540 micromoles of mm-hmm. light. The relative irradiance is what we were measuring to give us, a, you know, consistency between the lights that we were te- we were testing. And at that relative irradiance, we had 350 um, nanometers, and there's no other light that we had that went below 400 nanometers out of all the other lights that were in my entire farm. So, and no, no infrared whatsoever yeah. out of it, any LED. So mm-hmm. you have. A high focal point on blue, okay? Yep. I don't I can't wrap my head around that. If it's all blue light and the majority blue light and purple light and you know or violet light and green light, um that, that's not the sun. And mm-hmm. people saying that the corals don't need those other light spectrums. Well, maybe the corals don't need the other light spectrums. What about the environment that they're in? Maybe they need the other light spectrums to keep something like a bacteria or a microbe at bay because mm-hmm. it wouldn't thrive in a full spectrum system yeah. where with a blue light only system, maybe it's allowing certain bacteria or, or, or microbes to thrive, which then can be detrimental to the health of the corals. Interesting. You, you never That's know. A theory. Yeah. You never know. Interesting well, way to look at it. though. I'll, I'll find out soon though, well, because you know when you find out, <laughs> I took some scrapings of the algae yeah. and I took some scrapings of one of the torches that was dying. 
-hmm. and I put it into this preservative that was given me by a pathology professor at UF. And um, he said, when I get a bunch of samples together, make sure I label them and I send them to him and he'll yeah. tell me exactly every single species of whatever is in there that if it, if it's known to science, love it, they'll give me that. So that's awesome. I'm kind of excited about that. That's going to be, um, cause we actually had that problem <laughs> on a bunch of other corals, not just the torch corals. Um, we had set pastures that we had farmed for a decade and a half and we had like 700 frags overnight, just go melt. Uh, that hurts. But, oh man, I was devastated. I'm like, come on. So I put metal halides up over that, and the few that we had left, they, they didn't die. But I did take one that was receding and throw it in the preservative because it was going to die anyhow. I need to know what's on it, what's killing that coral, and they'll be able to tell me that. So that's something for down the road. I can't wait to get that information because if I can figure yeah, out how I mean, to keep – Let me know when you find out. I need to know. I will. <laughs> I'll probably end up doing a video or something on it, you know, at least talking about yeah. it. Um, it's, I think it's important every reefer know anything that we find out if we're confident in our results and what we know and what we learned. And, you know, again, it's all a lot of, a lot of theories come out there, come out of my mouth, but um, if it's been, you know, practiced and, and pretty much what we, what we know and nothing's changed, mm -hmm. I'm ready for somebody to prove me wrong. Cause I want to know something wrong. I want to make it better. I want to do it even better than what I already am. Yep. So that's the thing. Everybody's gotta be open-minded when they're putting a theory out there, because if they think it's right, it could be wrong. Yep, exactly. Okay, another one for you. Um, another thing for unhappy corals, pests. Um, dipping corals, and se second question, with new imports, if you just get a coral shipped in, are you going to dip it right away? Or do you think that's too much stress for it? Or uh, how do you go about... It, 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 it makes people's head spin what we do. Um, the corals come in from the wild, they're in a box. Yep. Mm -hmm. They've been in there, especially now since COVID, they're in the box for uh, how that one shipment last week was 75 hours from the first box being packed until the last box was opened. Yeah. That's a long time. I mean, it, my suppliers are good enough that they get it here alive. Now, mm -hmm. if it's not happy when it gets here, the worst thing I can ever possibly do is stick that coral back into something that's going to stress it out even more. Yeah. And dipping a coral from the wild before it goes into my system is the worst thing I ever did in the beginning stages of me importing corals. And I also acclimated my corals in the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing any reefer can do because, you know, Jake Adams will tell you straight up, and, and him and I talk about this all the time, corals self-acclimate. Mm -hmm. Matching the water parameters, a waste of your time. Yep. Matching the temperature, a waste of your time. Dipping your corals upon arrival from the wild just is a recipe for death. Yeah. And I learned that the hard way. So as a importer, as a complete nutter coral geek, don't acclimate your corals when you buy them from a shop. Take water from your aquarium that you're going to dip them in and dip them before they go to your QT and then go to your shop. Don't temperature acclimate. Don't drip acclimate. Drip acclimation is actually one of the worst things you can do because – Especially if the coral has been in the bag for, you know, amount of hours, it mm -hmm. will cause ammonia to build. And as you drip acclimate them, it ends up ammonia being toxic. toxic. And then you end up stressing the coral out even more. So get it out of that water and get it into your water as soon as possible. No matter what the temperature is, no matter what the water parameters are, your coral is mm -hmm. not going to care. He's actually yep. going to thank you for not putting him through hell. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> I, I know because stuff that's been shipped for a while, like I, I've always kind of felt the dipping process, at least right away, is more stressful to the coral. This is why I'm curious how you do it. Well, you know, there, there is something that, that my wife, I'm glad she's putting a little sign up to remind me. There, there, is, there is a, okay, I do, I do dip, but it's not a dip. It's, a, yeah. it's, like, a, it's like a bath. Mm -hmm. So I don't dip in like concentrated dips or anything like that, but I, I use... um. A specific antibiotic on elegans corals because you know everybody hates the indo elegans corals because you know there's nobody taking the proper precautions to learn what the problem is with them when they come in and they just deteriorate mm -hmm. and that's not good enough for me i don't want to lose any of the day going corals i import because if not if i left them alone they'd be thriving in the wild but instead i decided to bring them in for people to enjoy i gotta figure out my, my goal is to make sure to figure out why do they die how can i fix it yep. and how can i spread that word to everybody else so we have a method, it's not perfected yet, so I'm not gonna tell people how to do it, but it's in its 
embassy of, of and it works extremely well, but it's not perfect yet. Elegance corals, when they come in, my suppliers are doing this exact thing as well when they get them to help prevent that from happening in their systems if they hold them long term, as well as help prevent that from happening and starting up even worse in the bag. So Elegance corals, we use an antibiotic bath mm. on it's a 12, no, 18 to 24 hour bath. Oh, wow. with a, yeah. But mm. that, the reason why is because we think that the bacterial infection that is causing the problem with them is it's a slow acting and reacting bacteria, which slowly affects the coral, which either makes it peel off the skeleton or it makes it get really fat and puffy and all the tentacles get really short and stubby. And that's, <laughs> we call it the Elecon's coral disease. Well, we have, we think we have figured out how to fix that problem completely. Because I nice. don't lose elegance corals like we used to, and I've got one customer that didn't want an elegance coral, but he wanted it so bad because it was so beautiful. I'm like, how about you, you take it from me, yeah, and put it in your display tank. If you start having problems, you know, I will reimburse you entirely for it. But mm -hmm. I, I knew that coral had been in my facility and been through multiple of these baths, and it was here for months and it's thriving. Nice, and he still has it to this day. It's been two years. That's awesome. And um, he's like, every time I buy elegance cores, I'm buying them from you and you own them. <laughs> <laughs> so on certain things, I, I, think it's, I think it's important, you know, but a bath is different than a, but it is water from the system. They would have gone in anyhow. Yeah. And being the fact that we put them into a tank that has a power head in it and we have lights over it so that the coral can act naturally by expanding and contracting by pulling that antibiotic in and out of its tissue is I think the reason why the, um, whatever that pathogen is that's in them gets taken care of over time. Mm -hmm. So, okay. How, how about acros? Do you acros? do a similar thing with them? Oh, I, <laughs> everybody freaks out about acro flatworms, red bugs, all this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm, we're importers, you know, I, I, I would have to have a full-time employee working 40 hours a week, taking care of acros. If that's what I worried about. Um, you know, do we have pests that come in a hundred percent? I'm mm -hmm. never going to deny the fact that pests come in on wild corals, maricultured corals. They come in. But I used to be that way. Like we're mm -hmm. talking about right now. I used to be like, you know, we got to dip all the acros. We got to do this. We got to. I, I get so tired of wasting time and wasting money on it. And I, I figured out a better way to do it. And, mm -hmm. and it works. It truly works. The corals go right from the bag straight to my system with full of other acros. Yeah. Oh my God, you're going to contaminate them with all the other stuff and pests that are coming on this wild stuff. Um, yeah, but <laughs> it doesn't matter with what we do because they all get taken care of. Um, all the pests get taken care of. I haven't seen an acro flatworm or a red bug in, yeah. since we've been doing what we're doing now. So what are you doing? Probably, <laughs> our wild coral system, our input yeah. system, and, and I don't recommend you do this on <laughs> anything but a QT style tank. Okay. You want to clean your acros up. Mm-hmm. And, I, and this will work. You want to clean your Montes up. You want to clean up your zoanthids. It'll, this will really irritate the crap out of your zoanthids, but it's not going to irritate them to the point where it's going to kill them because there's only going to be in there for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Peppermint shrimp. Yep. I use – I buy about 250 peppermint shrimp for an 8-foot by 4-foot tank with nothing but SPS coils in it. Yep. And I replace uh, – I have to replace them because I also have wrasses and other fish, you know, I got it's a whole concoction. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's funny when you put them in and you get to watch the, uh, Ludison's wrasse, just picking them off left and right until they find a place to hide. And then yep. of course I'm back there with my view box looking going, okay, I see peppermints here, here. He can't get them there. Mm -hmm. I know all the spots in the tank where the Ludison can't go. So of course all the peppermints congregate to that area mm -hmm. at nighttime. I've gone in there oh, and I've out. seen all of them out, just cleaning everything, all the rock bases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen them actually pulling flatworms from wild corals right off and just shoving them in their yeah. mouth and chewing them. So I mean, you, you have an army of army pest of hunters pepper. in like yes. the quarantine system yes. so, and they take care of it. Okay. That makes sense. Like you have copious amounts of pest hunters. Copious. As a Hope matter of fact, sounds. I'm getting a thousand tomorrow. So, <laughs> cause I got to replace them. Yep. <laughs> But hey, it's um, a good way to do it. It's going to be a lot easier on them than going through a ton of chemicals and different dips and whatnot. So I still will not guarantee my wild and mariculture acros to be pest free, mm -hmm. but I will guarantee you that if you find one, it's not going to be a plague proportions <laughs> because yeah. 
I can pick up any acro in my system. And before I did this, I would let them go for like two or three weeks after I imported them. Then I would take them all out and we'd have like eight dipping trays, putting acros in, mm-hmm. wasting all these stupid chemicals that are just toxic and yep. can't be good for the corals. And Well, if you leave them in too all- long, you'll lose the coral. So shows- <laughs> I'm a scatterbrain. I'm, yeah. I have a hard time focusing on one particular project. I'm trying to do multiple things at the same time. So believe me, that happened more times than I care to even admit to. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. But the um, the whole fact of doing everything you can do as natural as possible, and I can pick up any acro that's been there. I've got acros that we had since before Christmas. I can pick them up and look at them. And, I, and before peppermint shrimp went in there, I could see bite marks over all of those things. Oh, shit, here we go. We got to go dip them again. Yeah. Got to take the grating out. Got to power wash it off because the eggs. Mm-hmm. I can pick up any acro right now, even the ones that have been here for months. And yeah. I will not find a single bite mark or a single mm-hmm. flatworm on them. And they'll be attached to the grating every time I go to pick them up. Two weeks after I put it down, it's attached. And I got to pry it off the rack because they're thriving now compared to what they used to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So, natural ways of doing all of this is my goal. Everything we talked about has basically been shooting for the natural, right? Like not dosing everything, you know, using, you know, scrubbers, pulling all the nutrients, using biological pest control. Oh, natural for the win. It doesn't have to be hard. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, there's so much marketing and pushing of all this stuff and ways to do things. It's like, God, if people went back to the basic, simple method of Kalkwasser and did it the way we learned to do it, mm-hmm. their, their their reefing experience would be so much more enjoyable, in my opinion. And they wouldn't have their head just spilled with tons of numbers that, honestly, I'm going to say it again. I don't think they mean anything unless your alkalinity goes below the 8.3, 8.0 mark. Then start worrying about it. it. And your calcium. You know, worry yeah. about the numbers, but don't, mm-hmm. don't, don't, what is it? How do you, uh, don't obsess about the numbers. Yeah. Because it's not, you know, worry about the low point, not mm-hmm. the high point. That's fair. And you'll have a much easier time reefing, in my opinion. I'm going to dabble more. I've always tried to just peg that elk, but I'm going <laughs> to I'm, I'm gonna ignore elk less and work on pegging the pH more. If everybody worried about their pH, there'd be a lot more smiles on reefers' faces. <laughs> I can guarantee you. Polyp extension. Polyp extension on acros. I mean, Pierre down here in Tampa from the Coral Corral he finally listened to me mm-hmm. after t- after a year of trying to get him to do it. And literally, he's only been dosing Calcwasher for like three weeks. And yeah. he calls me every single day. <laughs> Dude, I can't believe I'm trying to find my Angry Birds colony that I have. He's like, I thought I knew where it was. And he's like, I had to go in and wave my hand in front of the coral and make the polish retract so I could actually see that the coral was still there. <laughs> uh, that's and, awesome. But he said his Angry Birds has four colors in the polyps now. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I'm like, each polyp? He's like, dude, I've never seen anything like it. He's like, yeah. the potassium buffer, along with the MT, along with the calcwasser, mm-hmm. I'm seeing colors that I never that I never thought were possible out of corals. And I'm like, good for you. I'm happy your tank is happy now. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, now with the polyp extension... Do you think you're to say, because he has all this more polyp extension now, do you think that's from upping the pH and everything else, or is there other stuff you think that's helping improve it? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that the the, the amount of uh, CO2 in his system has been suppressed so much mm-hmm. that it's allowing all the other elements in the system to um, stay more stable. Allows yeah. your, your, you know, you're getting a more natural form of carbonates being added to your system by using the calc washer for one, you know, and the alkalinity buffer that he is using. I know where it's made. I know who produces it. I know everything about it. And I know it's not just a alkalinity buffer that is, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but they're, 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 they're just not going to stay in solution if you don't have a pH that is above the 8.25 mark. And it's because of that little devil called carbonic acid. It reacts with the carbonates and it makes it just dissipate. That's why you constantly add it. So the fact that the pH is boosted, I think the stability is more is there, which mm-hmm. then in turn, you talked about healthy corals. Yeah, They looked healthy before, but he never realized how unhealthy they were for over a decade. I mean, literally over a decade of pointing. That's all you. Is that that's all you know, though, right? I don't think a lot of people know better until they 
they see it for a while You're and exactly be like, right. that's amazing. You're exactly right, Devin. And, and, you know, and I started hearing, and I'm not going to mention any names, but all of a sudden people are start talking about boosting your suppressed pH, you know, and this and that. And they're acting like they talked about it and they invented something special. No, nobody did. I didn't even invent anything special. I just brought it back to life. And I'll be honest with you. I'm not trying to say that I'm the only one that talks about it, but I was the first person to bring it up over a year ago. And all of a sudden it's starting to catch on. And I think it's amazing that people are really listening and catching on to what the benefits of uh, a non-suppressed pH system is going to give you for results. I mean, it's yeah. in the results. It's my visual experience is way better than it used to be. That's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's awesome. I love it. Okay. So moral of the story, less, less carbonic acid, higher pH, happier corals. <laughs> Pretty easy way to sum it up right there. Um, and, and, and the money you'll save on all the other stuff you end up having to dose and try now, to remove. Go ahead. On that note, that actually what did kind of amaze me when I was dosing the hydroxides, how much, I had to lower my calcium reactor from that just because of removing that carbonic acid kept all the levels higher, higher. No, it you does. Need to you dose know, nearly as much. Cause everything stays in solution longer and allows your corals to actually utilize them the way they're meant to be utilized. If they're constantly fluctuating up and down and there's no consistency, is it the reason why the corals don't look natural when they grow? I don't know. I can't wait to find out because I don't have enough data to know from fragment to colony what, what the difference is, you know? So it, it's going to be really, really interesting. You know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, that, that, that stability because the pH, well, Pierre, when his pH started getting up into the, the high, you know, the mid two, 8.2s, all of a sudden his alkalinity dosing went from 250 mils a day down to like, no, 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 300 mils a day down to like 250. And now he's down, I think, under 200 mils a day. So I'm like, look at that, dude. You're 50% of your dosing, what it was. I said, how much would that dosing cost? Calculate it. He's like, like 25 bucks. And I'm like, how much calc washer did that cost you? He's like, mm -hmm. 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's cheap in the grand scheme of things. It is. It is. And then it's actually a more natural form of carbonates being added to your aquarium that actually allows it to stay more stable. And it's not a sodium-based carbonate um mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with them i mean i'm not knocking them at all um yes i am um <laughs> <laughs> i won't ever use them again after what i learned but you know it, it, it's it's what people know and it works it'll keep a help it'll keep your tank going but mm -hmm. if you get the idea to do something like we're doing you're going to be really happy with the results i guarantee it yeah for sure I, you're making me want to dabble again it's been a little little bit I need to tweak to some more. I tell everybody, if you want me to explain it, listen to me 100%, mm -hmm. and that's it. Just rewatch the stream like three times and soak it all in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We we, we kind of went off on a little bit here and there. It would take a lot for somebody to probably get it all out of it. But um, bottom line is, dose, towards, dose according to pH, mm -hmm. uh, the calc washer. Set the rules. If you have a control system, set it for your average pH, and then the next day, set it for the average and then you'll get your results that you're looking for, and you need to make sure you program your dosing pump to dose double of what your evaporation is because it will only really dose for a 12-hour period, not a 24-hour period. So you'll actually get your evaporation dosed in Kalkwasser, not top-off. Yep. Don't use your auto top-off anymore. Just let your Kalkwasser being dosed over that 12-hour period of time take care of all your evaporation. I have said, oh, well, my salinity is going to drop in the morning. It's going to drop by... 0.2 ppt if you're worried about that you really need to start rethinking reefing because that's nothing if it rains hard in the in the in the ocean out, out in the wild and you get a three inch downpour guess what the salinity is doing on those shallow reefs it's dropping a mm -hmm. lot more than 0.2 <laughs> yeah so true okay greg was asking does chris know how low you can run your elk in calcium with high ph that's a great question it's an excellent question because I don't know the exact, I don't know the answer to it. I have a theory on the answer to it from what I've been hearing from a lot of um, people that had the opposite effect happen when they started doing the calc washer. Um, some people that I talked to, because I'm telling people to do it slow by your average pH. I just went hog wild and I put the pH in that I wanted to go in and it, you know, took my alkalinity up real quick. 
the ones that were doing it slow noticed that their alkalinity was falling a little bit. So when their alkalinity was falling, I'm like, hey, just watch your corals. Remember, watch your corals. And I say, if you see something weird, then you better, you know, start adjusting mm -hmm. to compensate for that lower alkalinity. I have one of my customers that went down all the way down to 7.1 DKH. And he's like, I don't know why I need to go higher. My corals look amazing. And his pH is at 8.25 and yeah. goes to 8.31 during the day. And he's like, I haven't touched my alkalinity. It goes from 7.1 to 7.5, and I'm leaving it at that. So I'm going to say it again. It is different in every system. And if it's a slow, gradual fall to that, um, I don't see it being an issue. But I know that from my past experiences with euphilias, that I have a my, my alkalinity is an 8.3 to 8.6 because that's, that's where the brown jelly so ceased. And anything below that, I was getting brown jelly. But mm. now I got to look at it and say, was it my pH the whole time? Never know. Could be. I don't know. And I don't want to find out. <laughs> <laughs> you're never going to know because you're never going to let it drop that low again. If it happens uh, because of uh, my own complacency, then um, so be it. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I don't want to even experiment with that. Just keep it where I know and yep. let it go. Exactly. Um, okay. There's been a few questions in the chat asking which salty user recommend. I know you did mention you have a custom blender using now, but my custom blend, nobody's getting their hands on because <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not really, nobody can use it because of, we, we use it for a specific reason and, um, it's to help keep specific ions under control and we can't do it without this particular blend because everything else is going to have that there's elements in that i don't want in the salt mm -hmm. but you'd have to have it balanced so i had to have somebody formulate it properly so yep. everything else was balanced so we used um the um the captivate or reef blueprint line um it's formulate reef mm -hmm. um is what i recommend for people you can also get um um formulate uh, gosh, I can't remember all the names of it. We have three different kinds that are available. It's Formulate ATS. Mm -hmm. or no, Formulate NSW, natural seawater. So okay. it's formulated to give you natural seawater parameters according to the world ocean averages. So mm -hmm. all the majors, all the minors will all be, when you mix it, if you got it tested, it should be dead on what the average of the parameters ocean. are. Okay. Yep. And there's another one that is um, for red sea parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's an elevated salinity. Yep. And anything else that's in there that's elevated because of the Red Sea being so saturated because of where it is, that's what the parameters are. It's basically the same parameters of what the Red Sea would give you. Um, and then we have the Formulate Reef. Um, some people that were using uh, – some people tried the, the Red Sea, um, and I told them to be careful with that because if they are starting their reef out with that, they might have issues because of the ionic imbalance they're going to have because they've been used to using whatever they were using before. And then this – extra elevations of all the other ions that are in there might might cause problems and i can't predict what's going to happen exactly but you have to understand that it could be detrimental to some animals in your aquarium go slow. um yeah no go drastic slow. changes small water changes um so the formulate reef is um this is one of the coolest things that you know uh, i think is going to be available for to any reefer okay you can buy salts there's a, there's tons of different salts in the market um I can guarantee you for a fact that when you buy a bucket of salt from whoever you're buying it from, whatever brand it is, that from where it was put into that bucket to the time it got to you, mm -hmm. it was bounced around so many times that it's not blended anymore. Stratification. <laughs> exactly. All your heavy elements are going to sink to the bottom and nobody talks about that. So you're, you're using that salt. You're not, it's a 200 gallon mix. You're using enough to mix up 20 gallons. Well, guess what? Why people sometimes have crashes in their aquariums is because nobody tells them this information because you don't have a homogenous blend anymore. You have layers of mm -hmm. heavy to lighter elements as you go up that, up that bucket. If you're going to use a salt that is a mass produced salt, and there's nothing wrong with them. You know, they put it into a big salt hopper or a blender and they put all the ingredients in, they blend them all together and homogenize the mix. They put it into bags or buckets or whatever. Um, that's fine. It works. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, you know, obviously we hear about tank crashes here and tank crashes there when they get a water change. And then 90% of the time, I guarantee you it is, that is the reason why they had a problem because of all the moving of that particular salt box that they had and all the settlement. So this new salt that's coming out on the market is very, very unique because it's a 
four part salt. Mm-hmm. It's not blended. Blend it, it yourself? Is, no. No. It's you, 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 yes <laughs> and no. Yes and no. Okay. Um, you're going to get a part A, or a, mm-hmm. a part one, a part two, a part three, and a part four. Yep. And they all have to be mixed up at the same time. So if it's a 40 gallon mix, you have to mix the entire amount of that up at one time. You can't mix up less than that unless you actually read the directions mm-hmm. on how much of the sodium chloride <laughs> to weigh out exactly. A big how sticker. Much- read <laughs> the directions. <laughs> uh, it's the, only, the only thing that scares me about this salt is the fact that there's going to be people that don't read the directions and they're going to kill their tank and they're going to blame the salt when it's their own fault. Um, Again, mm-hmm. it goes back to the fact that most of the time when reefers have a problem, it's their fault, not the product's fault because of directions or whatever, misuse. Um, it happens to all of us. <laughs> I've, mm-hmm. I'm guilty. I used to do the same thing. But it has – sodium chloride is in one bag inside the blend. Yep. It's, it comes in a box. You got sodium chloride, then you have your magnesium, and it's a septahydrous um, magnesium uh, sulfate source, which is – so super clean. It blew my mind how clean this stuff was when you mixed it up. Um, and the reason why we have to mix that in a separate bag is because it's septahydrous and it wants to release all that water. And yep. if you put it in with the anhydrous stuff, it's just going to turn to a oh, brick. Yeah. <laughs> so then you have two bottles of solutions that are in there. And one bottle is um, a lot of your majors and some minors in solution already and the other bottle is the rest of your majors and the rest of the minors that aren't going to interact with each other in concentration so if you read the bottles you can actually mix a 20 gallon mix up no problem you can mix one gallon up if you want to if you follow the directions on the box Mm -hmm. but you'll be able to mix up and get exact parameters to the blend yeah and there's there's Maybe one or two other salts that I ever heard of that even do something similar to this that give you natural, you know, the actual parameters that you're supposed to get. Mm-hmm. Where if you're using a mass-produced salt that's in a hopper, if you're putting a gram of an element into that two-ton hopper, yeah. do you really think it's homogenized through the entire mix? I'm sorry, but that's just wishful thinking. It's not going to happen. So you're going to have hot spots of certain things in certain bags of that particular mix. So – there's not going to be consistency that you're going to get. You're going to get the most consistent results from this salt blend. And we started using that blend um, mm-hmm. and we got great results from it. But we are, again, always trying to make things easier on us. So we had a custom blend blended by Chris and sent to us. Nice. And uh, basically, it's got a lower potassium value in it. And if somebody did a water change on their, on their system with that salt, they'd probably crash the tank. But because we are putting so much potassium in certain systems, and I like to keep it in check, I don't like to do big water changes. I like to do little ones. And eventually, with all the ICPs and all the equipment we can use to dose the elements and stuff, I don't want to do a water change ever again. I want to just dose. Yeah. I mean, what's the point? Why not? Why not just add your minor and trace elements and make sure everything stays stabilized that way? Because there's no reason to do a water change because it's not going to be any better than the water you already have. My only thought is depending on the trace in your supplements, if there's impurities you don't know about, eventually they'll build up. Now, yes. that, that's my only thing about never doing them is you're fine for a long time, but eventually I think impurities might bite you in the butt long term. I, 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 agree. I agree with you on that. But there's mm-hmm. also, we learned a lot of different ways to remove Impurities. Certain minor yeah. certain traces. And then there's impurities. What are those impurities? You don't know what those impurities are. Exactly. In most yeah. Cases. So that's the great thing about having a physicist and a marine scientist <laughs> that helped me with that kind of stuff. Because when, I mean, when Chris started blending all this stuff for the formulations and everything, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't even tell him, but I was like, Gene, I'm like, let's test the MT. Let's run it through the ICP. Let's see what it's got in it. And he came back and he's like, well, the values are exactly what Chris says they're supposed to be in the bottle. And he's like, I found something very peculiar, pe- peculiar and I don't know where it's coming from. Mm-hmm. It's not something that I worry about because it's not really a contaminant. It's just, well, why is it there? Yeah. Why, you know, where did it come from? So then we told Chris about it and he's like, I don't know. All my, all my certificates for all the raw materials I have don't say anything about that. You know where it was coming from? Where? 
it was coming from the ICP machine itself. Oh. <laughs> and and Gene didn't realize that it was part of the, it was part of part of one of it was something that was building up from other tests mm-hmm. and it was coming in the test that way and um he fixed that problem quite quickly yeah. um and we don't see it anymore so uh that's the fun part about what we're doing it's it's all fun man we just learn something new every day testing water that's good. the fact that you have you know your buddy an hour away that can test everything on icp weekly is just amazing the experiments you could do and tweaks and things you can learn from it so cool he, he just told me that if i have something weird happened in my system where something things are just looking really sour mm-hmm. he's like all you got to do i don't care if it's three o'clock in the morning he's like, you can call me up you can grab your sample and you can motor your ass to my lab and he's like and i'll fire the machine up and run it so he can figure out if there's something in your water to fix the problem because he's watched the farm grow over the last two years and he's like he's waiting for like 15 or 20 corals to be available in the market and he's like can i get a piece of that yet no <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll give you another coral. <laughs> you know, I, 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 we got a good relationship and it's been very beneficial mm-hmm. for both of us. And um, I think we're going to be doing a lot of great things with Chris's help, you know, um, and my imagination, per se, yeah. and my, my ways of bringing up just off the wall things that a lot of people don't think about and then solving that, say, for say, issue. Um, that's what, you know, it just keeps things rolling, man. It's fun. It is. It is. Always experimenting, always learning. Love it. Always. Always. All right, Chris. It's been almost two hours. I won't keep you all night because I know you're, you know, it it easily. But thank you for coming on as I always. Go. We could go for two more easily, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah I just gotta... come back in a couple of weeks. <laughs> hey, yeah, just give me a shout. I'm so busy. Just give me a message. Hey, two days before. You want to yeah. do another live? All okay, right. let's do it. Okay, and, next, um, month, let's, next month, I'm going to rope you in again. We can continue the, the rabbit hole. I'm ready for it. Um, anytime. Awesome. Love it. Okay. So the new brand, um, if people want to pick it up, what were the stores you said? Um, it's, can find it? it's available online right now at two stores. It's Reef Masters. Um, it's in Bradenton, Florida. I actually, their website's a little bit different. I don't remember all the dash. There's a dash in there, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's Reef Masters. Um, and then um, Aquaholics Aquaculture. Um, she's got all the, the microfauna, um, micro, planktonic foods available as well as the, re, the reef blueprint line. Um, and she updates it every week according to what we have in stock. Nice. Awesome. So if it's not there, shoot her a message and, um, I might have it on the captivate side to, to be able to offer to you. Okay. Perfect. Always appreciate it, Chris. Um, Tracy Spellenberg and economical reefer. Thank you guys for the super chat. If you guys enjoyed this, as always, hit that like button. Always appreciated. And Chris, thank you again, buddy. I'm going to lure Devin. you back on next month. Way more rabbit holes to go through. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. I look forward to it, and I hope people got some uh, good content out of it. And, um, you know, happy to help out anytime. Awesome. All right, thanks so much, guys.